Good. Okay, now we're recording. Thank you. Uh, it is um, May 12th. This is billed as a joint meeting of the Finance Committee and the Town Council. At this point, we have a quorum of the Town Council present. So I'm going to pull the, count, pull the Town Council and call people by name um, and call the Town Council meeting to order at 109. Just making, just making quorum. Oops. Yeah. So uh, with that, uh, let's start. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Uh, ouch. May, uh, Lynn Greesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Uh, Dorothy Pan. I'm here. Jennifer Taub. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Yeah. Present. Andy Steinberg and Alicia Walker. Here. Uh, can I? I'm sorry, and Pam Rooney. Here. And then go ahead because we now have a quorum of the Finance Committee. So I'm calling the Finance Committee to order. And uh, this is a meeting that's being conducted by Zoom. I do want to remind everybody um, for both meetings that this is being recorded so that uh, we have provided that notification. And uh, I think that the you've already um, acknowledged the attendance of some members of the committee, and I won't go back and repeat um, those contacts. But I think we have Bob Hegner. I'm present. Okay. And uh, I did try and call Bernie and got no answer. It just kept ringing until. So, um, how do you want to proceed? Uh, the way that this is set up, uh, Lynn, uh, is that um, we are going to be starting with. Uh, to the public safety departments first um, in order is Cress, and um, then we're going to police. And uh, at least that was the order that Sean had established notified staff. So, um, Sean, do you have uh, initial questions uh, that you've received? And um, and uh, I know that Anna has prepared some questions and. Uh... Sure. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we lost Alicia. Can we hold for just a moment? Mm -hmm. She's back. Sean, I, I want to I want to just say really quickly, Andy, Sean got my questions like about a minute ago, and that's completely on me. So not not Sean's fault at all. Um, so just quickly. Um... Does everyone have a budget book that wants a budget book? Is there anybody who has not received one yet that does want one? Okay, uh -huh. Alicia, let me know if, you, if you'd like me to drop yours off or if you'd like to pick it up and I can arrange that. Perfect. Um, so yeah, so we received some questions. I forward those off. Um, the format is Earl will kick it off for us. You will, you know, an overview of, um, your department and, and kind of the things that are going on. Um, if you can answer the questions as you, you know, in your uh, opening remarks, great. If not, I can pull them up and we can go through them one at a time. Uh, we've done it both ways. So um, I'll kick it over to Earl. Thank you all for letting me be a part of this. Uh, last year, I was the only staff member of the department um, and I was meeting with PD and fire and boy, were they really holding me up. So I'm excited to share. Um, we recruited, um, which was a challenge uh, just kind of in the current market. July 5th, we started, uh, we swore in eight responders and a program assistant. Um, I just want to, for a moment, talk about what that team looks like. Um, of the eight, of the 10 folks who work in our department, eight of them lived, worked, or went to school in this town before we started. Um, seven of the 10 of us identify as people of color. Three of us identify as people with, with a disability. We really were able to bring to bear the diversity vision of the town in the forming of this department. Uh, we entered what we thought would be an eight week series of training. We ended up adding a week there at the end just to make sure we were good. September 6th, we began deployment. That makes us the fastest department in the country by about uh, 15 months. Uh, from the council deciding that Crestwood exists to us delivering services. Um, starting in September, 
times were slow. Um, we really, uh, Chief Nelson says this often, and I find it to be very true. We are building the plane as we fly it, which means that we are kind of constantly in this pull between operations, delivering the best services we can today with the things that we have available to us and uh, doing the groundwork to expand that. Um, so we started September 6th delivering services in town. Um, at the beginning, we were really um, kind of supplementing some volunteer things, getting to know folks. Uh, when we came out, our biggest thing was delivering meals for Meals on Wheels at the Senior Center. I know one of the questions was our impact on volunteerism. Uh, we very intentionally do not supplement, uh, do not take on a role that is served by a volunteer. When, age, when uh, the Survival Center, the Senior Center um, is lacking volunteers, they will often reach out to us to make sure that those services still happen, which was a real great thing for us as we were looking to start in the field. Um, so we, we kind of worked through September to January. Everyone worked nine to five, Monday through Friday. That really allowed for us to get a lot of supervision, some on the ground work, um, expanding kind of what the idea was. Um, our eight responders work in teams of two. Um, January, we began to, we expanded our shifts. Our current shifts are 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Monday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Tuesday through Friday, and 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturday. So that's about, you know, 10 different shifts uh, for a department that only has 10 people. We're pretty, pretty proud of that. Um, and that was developed looking at the call information in the LEAP report, um, but also kind of looking at the context nationally. Um, right now, we are preparing to begin our deployment on 911, which is for us our, our next big hill to climb. That has involved things like purchasing CAD software, record keeping software, entering into an agreement with the Donahue Institute at UMass to make sure that the data we collected met the needs of the town and potential funders in the future. Um, actually, about half of our team is meeting with them as we speak. Um, uh, I know some of the questions were around data. And uh, what I would say is currently we are very much, um, we are using a very vintage style of data collection. Um, it's a lot of hand, uh, paper and pencil. Um, ESO is a system that we will be onboarding at the end of May. Um, and so we will be able to generate data reports for folks, um, but we don't have that functionality today. Um, we have done 570 reports, so that's 570 unique calls for service. Um, that doesn't capture when we're in the community and someone kind of stops us and asks for a resource in the moment. It will at one point, but we, you know, early days we didn't quite get that. Um, of those 570, 556 of them were unique calls for service. Um, the other 14 were actually more calls for consultation. Uh, a business is struggling with someone, they call us. They don't actually want us to come do anything. They want us to talk their staff through how they might handle it, what resources they might use. Um, we don't uh, currently break the calls down into, I know there was a ask about calls for schools, nonprofits, businesses, the town. Um, again, with our, our current technology, we don't have that functionality, but we do believe we will have it by the end of this fiscal year. Um, we purchased uh, radios. We use a, a, a radio system I'm really proud of. Um, it is on the cellular network. Um, it actually has been such, such a success that the fire department is transitioning over to it um, on Blarney, uh, the day of the event known as Blarney. Um, if you were in one of the emergency operating centers, there were points in the day where the only radios you could hear in those spaces were ours. Um, that is, again, a testament to the existing first responder groups. Um, we are working with several different collaboratives to try to gain the wisdom of other departments. Uh, really the idea being as much as possible, we don't wanna make all the mistakes for the first time. We'd like to learn from some other communities. Um, currently we are not doing joint calls. We are not a co-response department. Um, so you won't see a crest responder come out of a police car any more than you'll see a police officer come out of a fire truck. Um, we have distinct work. Um, there have been calls where we've shown up and police have arrived at the scene and all of those have been handled professionally um, with dignity for the person involved. Um, we all, uh, because of the training that folks receive from police, the police department, a uh, special shout out to, to Officer Ting, who has been a, was a real robust part of our training milieu. Uh, we have a sense of what it looks like when police are doing their work. So when to step back, um, our relationship with the other departments is, um, I think a model for departments of our type in the country. 
Um, you often hear of them talking about fighting a battle in the public safety sphere. We do not. There is nobody in the police or fire department I can't call right now with a question that I wouldn't get an answer back before the close of business today. Um, and I'm, that's, that is a, a unique feature of our community and a testament to the humility of the public safety folks uh, working. Um, doo -doo -doo. Um, so we have, we've received two calls from dispatch, but I would, I would say that, that we are not on 911. So those were both very specific situations that uh, the dispatch thought we were the right folks to handle. Um, until we take 911, that just isn't the way that works currently. Um, all of our calls are self-initiated, which means that either someone reached out to us and we decided to send a resource or we saw something happening in the community and kind of responded to it uh, out. We continue to develop policies, protocols, procedures, traditions, customs, norms, all those things that you need to have a healthy institution. Um, and I don't know, I would say that that we are, uh, my expectations are of the, that 556 number, I, I, my ultimate goal is to get us closer to what the LEAP report suggests, um, but that can only happen with time and experience. That number would be closer to 4,000 calls a year. Um, I, I don't know exactly when that will happen, but I want you to know that that's my goal. That's what we're driving towards. Um, and we are shooting 100% on goals that we set on achieving them in a time period faster than anybody else in the country has uh, more efficiently and with, with better production on the other end of it. So I don't know. I, I live in this thing. I, I love it. It's the best job I ever had. I could talk about it forever. Um, I just want to note again, it's important for me to say this out loud, that the police department and fire department have been wonderful partners in this at dispatch. Uh, Mike Curtin and his team have been wonderful partners for us. When there has been disagreement, we have always uh, ended up on the thing that we believe served the town the best. And I hope that that continues uh, as long as the department exists. Uh, so I will stop talking and start answering questions. Do I call on people? Andy, you're muted. Um... Andy, you're, still, you're, you're still muted. Sorry. Um, Sean, is there anything else that uh, you need to? Um, I, th I think Earl covered pretty much um, the questions that I'm looking at right now. Um, if not, we'll oh. um, feel free to, if somebody knows he uh, the question question was submitted that wasn't answered feel free to jump in or I'll, I, you I, I, yeah I have one the one that I did not answer is the call types will take um, and I, so I pulled this up um, so nonviolent calls to the school um, violence is a rule out category for us anywhere so saying nonviolent before a thing is just a reminder to us that, that that's what we take um, non-criminal trespasses um, is something we aspire to take obviously if it's criminal it still sits with the police department community engagement um, follow-up assist other PD, um, and this allows us to support Amherst College's police department, UMass's police department if things come up, and, and that will only be generated when they request us specifically. Citizen transport, mental health, well-being check, assist business. It's important to note that the way that the, the system in town works is that uh, town departments are also considered businesses. So this would, if we went to Bueno, or we went to the rec department, those would both be assist businesses calls. Assist citizen, um, assist uh, admin calls. Uh, that's really when one of us is gonna be out. Assist AFD, assist APD, assist uh, APD assisting Crest, the Crest business line. So a call that comes in through our business line that's initiated. Um, and that's really what we have now. I do expect that kind of as the rubber meets the road, as the work hits the air, that that list may change. It may grow, it may uh, decrease. Um, and when we start, I think folks should expect that we will start the way we have with everything with low, slow, achievable calls, and then slowly but surely building up a capacity. Um, we are we are not trying to be showboats about this thing. We intend to win. We intend to be successful. And so that means we, we will increase the intensity and complexity of calls over time to ensure that the responders are able to grow into first responders, which there is no way to do that except to take 911 calls. So sorry, that was the, the last question I missed. Thank you. Um, let me, Anna, I'm going to see what. 
Thank you. Um, Earl, you you answered a lot. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing. And I apologize for having my camera off. My only question is actually, my only remaining question is about the org chart um, that was in the budget book. And it says the eight Crest responders and then an admin assistant. Where's the program assistant on that chart and in the budget? Do you also uh, have an admin assistant? Is it just missing? Yeah. The, the admin assistant is the program assistant. Um, the implement the okay. implementation manager position, which is where uh, the program assistant is currently vacant. The implementation manager position is paid for out of the DPH grant. That's currently where Cat Newman sits. Right. Um, and I'm proud to say we've had okay. a real good response to that program assistant position. We expect to fill it very soon. Okay, that's great. Um, and so, but so Cat Cat's role is the implementation manager role now. Yes. And you have applied for the the DPH grant moving forward, correct? Yes, um, in the most recent Senate budget, it was uh, 99 per, 99% back, and we, we hope that we'll get all of it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, if, you're, if you have nothing further on it, then I'll ask Dorothy. Okay, so I have a, a couple of questions, and you are getting into one of them, uh, and that is the the big four hundred fifty thousand dollar DPH grant um, is likely to continue in some form or other for a while uh, before you're just a regular budget item in the town budget. Oh, you muted yourself at the end there. Yeah, I am. So that's my question. One is is that it's going to be some public funding for a while it seems to be pretty secure and then we will somehow pick this thing up is that right yeah i i so i think um so on the dph grant uh this is this year has looked exactly like what last year looked like um mm -hmm. it wasn't in the governor's budget it was a little bit in the house budget and it was restored in the senate so i that may be the life cycle of, of how this looks every mm -hmm. year um so I, we're, there is no, it is at currently still a year to year grant. Um, and we expect that until something changes, until they ask us to reapply or something that we would continue to get it. Um, mm -hmm. On the other piece, um, I know, I, I want folks to know that we are committed to kind of entrepreneurially looking at uh, funding sources. Mm -hmm. And that isn't just about money. Um, we are, we hope to always have some funding from the state because having uh, the state have some skin in the game will help us long term. There are long term legislative questions of Crest that can only be solved by the legislature. Uh, this allows us to have a direct line to them. Um, we also uh, hope to open up federal funding resources, which are fairly common for public safety. Um, we're engaged in talks with folks who are on that level of things. Um, we also expect to apply for grants from the private sector. Um, yeah. from from groups around the country that are looking to seed this work. Um, and, you know, the town budget is a part of it. it, it it's meaningful. It's, it's helpful. It's, it help, is helpful in recruiting folks that we are funded by the town of Amherst. Um, but we are looking for funding from any source that's available to us. Um, and we recognize the constraints of town budgeting and, and are aware and coherent of that all the time. And yeah. just a quick follow up. Um... All 10 responder positions and benefits um, and the, the beginning of an operating budget, those are already in the general fund budget. The DPH grant is funding sort of startup costs for the program and uh, oh, okay. wraparound services and, and additional services um, that are really provided to the community, um, training, uh, things like that. But the sort of the core of the CREST program is already funded within the operating budget. Great. That, that, that is so good to hear. Um, I had a, a, another question than a comment. Um, I had the pleasure of, of, as I sat waiting for my car to get repaired since 7.30 this morning, of reading through this beautiful budget book while well, starting the budget book. So thank you, Athena, for the um, personalized hand delivery. Um, the, this phrase, motivational interviewing, uh, you've mentioned it, it's been in the reports, but I can't figure out what it could mean. So I'd, I'd love to have an explanation. Yeah, absolutely. Motivational interviewing is a framework of, of behavioral health connection. Um, it really is a framework around asking open-ended questions to people to help them to find, uh, you know, a lot of our work is, is when we run into a person, they don't even know that they have a problem. They're just in the midst of a challenge. So mm -hmm. helping them to navigate through that, um, 
helping them to understand what their own wants and needs are, what's possible, what's doable, what their own kind of restrictions are. It's an evidence-based practice. The Department of Mental Health offers it to their staff uh, regularly. Um, and it really, uh, it's a training that through the grant we've been able to offer to other folks and allows us to have a common language. Um, mm -hmm. Often getting other providers to understand, to, to take the training, allows them to understand why we take such a slow and deliberate pace when we work with people. Um, we don't want to force them to do anything they don't want to do, um, but we also want to kind of support their recovery process. Um, anybody who's interested in, the trainings happen fairly regularly in town, and this is not just for the folks on the screen, but folks outside. I would love to have folks attend a training. Um, I think it's useful um, in the real world in lots of places. We offered it at the library, and they have found that in interacting with folks, it allows them to do that in a place that um, doesn't feel so top down. Um, and actually that idea came from the folks doing this work in Akron, Ohio. They had piloted it with a team and found great results. Okay. Okay. And then uh, a quick question about Elliot Homeless Services. I, I, I know of, El I've heard of Elliot, I think it's Elliot Home Care Services, where there's day service offered where you can bring people in, but this says homeless service. Is that the correct title or a typo? Yeah, Elliott Homeless Services is a DMH funded program that provides uh, outreach to folks in the homeless community, particularly folks who are um, what they would consider, you know, duly challenged or who have been homeless for an extended period of time. Um, there's two folks doing outreach network here. Um, I believe they're an outbreak of Riverside Community Services. So there's not a lot of that work um, from that agency happening here. But Elliot also works in Boston. They have great results with folks who are, you know, it, when you've been homeless for a few years, it's really hard. I, I, it's one of the things I think about a lot. If you've been living outside for three years and we get you into an efficiency apartment, it can feel claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a real need for supports around that. Um, and uh, Jay Levy, who is an Amherst resident, is the director of that uh, that agency. Okay. So, and my, my last thing is, um, mm -hmm. I enjoyed um, meeting with some of the Crest workers. Uh, I think it was at the grief circles. Um, and when I see their pictures, I can't put the names to, the, to them that well yet. And I'm just thinking maybe we could have some kind of uh, like three three hour social interaction event with changing tables or games or, you know, some kind of way so that we can all be intermingling. And, and when we when we walk out of there, they know who we are. and We know who they are. I, I, I think that would be really nice. Um, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. Thank you. Okay. okay. So that that's it for my questions and comments. But thank you. Okay. So, Pam. I, I lost my clicker. Sorry. Um, back to mundane questions. Um, I'm interested to know if there is um, a focus or or if, if nuisance calls, so the non-criminal nuisance calls will be part of your repertoire. Um, I was reminded of that last night with my windows open and um, a great deal of noise coming from nearby establishments just um, what, what is your take on that kind of um, assistance? Yeah, every month it's an increasing category for us. I'd say this week we've done six or seven of them, um, often trying to get out there early. Um, the hard part and, and the nuanced part that we're going to have to develop is the difference between a criminal nuisance and a non-criminal nuisance is context. It's where, when, who... Um, and so there are times where people call us for a thing and we, you know, there's a sense that there might be violence involved, a sense that folks might want to do a trespass. So we're still really developing our capacity yeah. to work through that. Um, but it, it grows every day. Um, and we had something we expect to do more and more of. And the results have been, you know, fairly good. We, you know, gotten calls from uh, one of our most successful ones is we got a call about a, a really upset person in town hall. Uh, and when we were able to get there, the responder who went there was able to engage so well with this person that we were able to take a person who'd been homeless on the streets in Amherst for two years and actually uh, uh, support them to access shelter 
uh, for the first time in, in years and actually get them to stay there. And now we're working towards permanent housing with a person who, when we first, you know, I, I made the first attempt at, at engaging with them, it did not go very well. Um, so this is a, this is a really uh, yeah. nice thing. But yeah, those, those sorts of things. And I would say the other part is working with the community to understand the difference between, you know, sometimes there is some level of, of annoyance from our neighbors that is just part of living with people. Um, and so helping people to understand the difference between that, you know, is someone uh, violating a town bylaw? Are they somehow impeding the peace? Or is this just a person who is a loud talker, which I am. So, uh, so yeah, I think there's, there's lots to learn on all ends. We're doing that. Um, and we'll be doing, you know, once we start on 911, I anticipate that, that will grow. Um, and, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Earl, I want to start by thanking you for your part in the presentation on Wednesday night. I don't think any of us as counselors expressed our appreciation to all three of you about the extensive work each of you has done with your teams. And so I think it's important for us to publicly be out there and saying thank you. Um, I had an, a really significant takeaway from, from Wednesday night and it's very relevant to this discussion. One of my takeaways from Wednesday night was, because of CRESS, we may find ourselves providing services in this town that we have not been able to provide in the past. And you just gave a beautiful example of the homeless person. And so as much as people keep wanting to balance the possibility that we could reduce our police, the reality is, I don't think so. I think we're gonna find that we're gonna to continue to have a full police force and a full CRESS operation, whatever that means, because we are going to be able to provide more comprehensive services to the residents of our town that we were not able to provide in the past. And I cannot say that enough, but I started to hear that emerge, that realization emerge on Wednesday night. Um, I do want to ask, not necessarily today, but sometime in the future, if you would share the scope and the timeline for evaluative data that you'll be receiving about CRESS, because I think it's that evaluative data that begins to help shape where we think CRESS will go down the road and into the future. Yeah, I actually think that's a pretty simple-ish question to answer these days. Um, we expect to have a, a report on the kind of first year of operations to provide in September, which will be our year anniversary there. Uh, our contract with UMass uh, hopefully will provide us with an evaluative tool uh, by the end of the calendar year. Um, and then we do anticipate our, my goal from day one, the town's goal from day one has been that people will be able to go to the town website and get as close to real time data from us as possible. I would encourage folks to go look at the Durham, North Carolina website for their responder team to look at the kind of bar we're setting for ourselves. Now, I do want to say that they have a lot more money than us, so it may not may not be as pretty as that, but it'll be uh, it'll be the, the small town version of that. Um, and, you know, I, I think we, we recognize the importance of that. So it's something that we'll talk about kind of as regularly as possible. Um, folks are doing the work right now. As soon as we're able to generate those reports, we will share them with you. Thank you. Um, I also have a comment uh, that uh, really is sparked by Dorothy's question about the grant. And um, that is that um, it's been observed by um, Senator Comerford and Representative Dom that as programs like this continue to emerge in the Commonwealth, we may not be able to get that grant on a regular basis. Uh, and but there may be other things that we should look at as well. So it's really use. It's heartening to know that we are already caring uh, all of our responders and st uh, all of you on our regular budget. Uh, and the grants being used to augment that budget because um, grants can go away in a heartbeat. So again, thanks a lot. A great yeah. start. And, you know, July 1st, mm -hmm. July, whatever it is, 4th, 1st, I think it is. We actually have the anniversary of swearing the first group in. Yeah. And, and it's important to note, first group in New England, you know, this is, uh, we, we are setting the tone for everyone. I would encourage folks, uh, if you're if you're hoping to support us, talk to legislators 
about uh, state funding. Um, you know, one of my hopes is that at some point, we are a public safety department. Um, while that public safety approach may look different, um, public safety is at the core of our approach. Um, and being eligible for state public safety grants for crime prevention grants, for judicial diversion grants would be really important. And it's important to note that that is not something that any of us have control over. So it's important that as folks advocate that we don't forget to advocate with the whole state um, to make sure that we're able to access all those things. I do hope people join us soon though. Thank you. Okay, so other questions at this point is I think and move on to the police if there are no other questions for Earl. And Earl, I, because uh, we just had so long with you the other night and from, with other two other boards involved, uh, you know, a lot of we really did a lot of thinking and uh, asking of questions. And so between the two, I think that we really have gained a great appreciation and we know that. Uh, this is an evolving process. And so some of the questions that might be on our minds are uh, things that we're sort of, I, I, for one, am leaving in the background because I know that you're working on things and you need time to develop it and to work with the other departments and cooperatively. And that's where I'm confident we're going. And uh, I think, we can report that the budget um, is set up to enable all of us, all the departments and public safety to work together to achieve that. So thank you. I appreciate you, Andy. If I could just take one quick moment, uh, I just want to thank Chief Livingstone. None of this would have been possible without him being the human being he is. Um, his mentorship, his guidance, um, and his example has been of immense value to this department and it will bear fruit for us uh, for as long as this department exists. I know this isn't really the thing he's into, but it is important to me that we say this publicly, that his legacy will live on with us forever. Um, and, and I couldn't have had a better partner in doing this thing than Chief Livingstone. And so I wanted to thank him here for it. Appreciate you all. Thanks, Earl. So that's, uh, I will turn to the chief and uh, this uh, is going to be one of my last opportunities to uh, call you Chief Livingstone. Uh, but uh, I, too, want to thank you. I've known you for a long time and worked with you for a long time and really have appreciated what you have done in uh, providing leadership to the department and uh, you know, just building on a very good department and making it a better department. Uh, which is hard to do when you inherited a good department. Uh, so thank you for all that you've done for the town on behalf of uh, me as one of the elected people who's sort of overseeing things. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you to, if you have any introductory comments on the budget. And then uh, I'll go between you and Scott and uh, Sean for uh, to make sure that the questions that he's aware of um, are uh, get, a, get asked first because people have provided Sean with uh, questions. So, Chief? Sure, thanks. And thanks, Andy, for those kind words. I mean, um, I'll actually miss these types of meetings, believe it or not. And um, I actually used to enjoy town meetings standing up in front of that body as well. So, call me crazy. But um, probably the only department head that enjoyed that. But in any case, um, thanks for having us today. Um, Captain Ting is here, Captain Gabe Ting. Ron Young is here with us as well in case there are administrative type questions. And Mike Curtin will handle the um, majority of the communication center's um, budget explanations and stuff. But if it's okay with you, Sean, can we go um, animal welfare communications and then police? I, I don't have any issue with it as long as somebody on the Just committee does. Animal welfare is pretty straightforward. Um, and I know you all have the budget books in front of you. Carol continues to do an outstanding job. You know, the majority of her budget is her and, and the job that she does. Um, and the job that she does is outstanding. And she's actually a lot of fun to work with. And I know the cops really appreciate the fact that she's here and in this building. So, um, you know, her accomplishments are all there for you. 
challenges, the long range objectives, the opening of the new dog park, it, you know, gave her a little bit of extra work, but I think she enjoys it. She won't say that, but she enjoys the uh, extra work. Um, and everything that she does is, is just really outstanding. So I, I don't really have anything to add um, other than the fact that unless there are questions specific to um, to Carol's job. And she informs me that she plans on being here at least two more years. She did just bring on, uh, the good news is she just did bring on a unpaid intern um, who's a local resident and she's gonna be outstanding if someday she's Carol's successor. We finally got her to agree to bring somebody on board as a intern to start learning the ropes. But um, it's a local young lady and she's, been you know mingling with the cops and everything and everybody's getting along great so so that's good news that we've got you know carol to step in that direction so um unless there are specific questions uh, again her budget is pretty straightforward most of it is her personnel line item and then some little add-ons she does have in the mix a new vehicle coming hers is in really bad shape we don't like her to leave town with it because it's just it's getting old and rusty and things like that. So um, we're trying to get it here. It's on back order, like a lot of police vehicles are. So um, that's the only about the only thing we're waiting for is a new vehicle for Carol. Questions? Anything I missed? I don't think so. I didn't see any questions on animal welfare that came in. Did you, Sean? So. we can go on okay we'll move on to communication center uh, mike Curtin is here um to go over some of the details and specifics of um, of mike's comm center we had a um we've been struggling a little bit to get the personnel up at the um communication center we've had a couple in uh, uh dispatchers leave in the last year and you know the folks that have been applying to the position aren't always sure whether the communications job is the type of job that fits for them. So it's been kind of, we've had people come in and interview, they try it out for a while, it doesn't work for them. Uh, we just had a new uh, young man in today who looks like is gonna be a good fit, but I'll let Mike speak about that. Um, so we currently are at 11 dispatchers. Um, and again, we have one vacancy there and we're hoping to fill that position um, with this new gentleman who came in today to meet some of the folks. But uh, Mike, you ready to go? Sure. I mean, Chief's covered just about all of it. And if you look at our budget, you know, 98% of our budget is personnel. Um, we do have a couple of capital things coming up that I'm here to uh, discuss if anybody has any questions about those. Our greatest challenge, especially coming out of COVID, is hiring. Uh, we used to put an application process out. We get 100 plus people apply. Now we're getting, we're lucky if we get 25, 30. And we had a round of interviews recently where we invited seven people in for interviews and only two showed up. Um, two were nice enough to let us know the morning of that they weren't coming in. And then the rest were just simply no shows. Um, we had a couple good candidates that we offered. One candidate in particular, we offered the position. He was all set to go leaving the interviews. Um, and then he decided that he didn't want to work the overnight shift. And we just can't hire somebody for specific shifts. Um, you know, not getting into union stuff or anything like that, but we're kind of uh, struggling in competition against other communities, but they're going through the same thing as well. Uh, we've hired a, we made an offer and hired and went through the whole uh, initial phase of training with an experienced dispatcher who came from a much bigger community and was kind of surprised on how much we do in Amherst as dispatchers decided they'd go back to their old job beside instead of work here. So um, I really don't have much else to offer or to put out there right now, but if you do have some questions, I'm certainly here to answer them. Andy, can I ask a couple of questions? Just things sure. I think. Sure, go ahead. Um, two things, Mike. Can One, um, this budget includes the creation of the second lead dispatch position. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that position? And then the sure. second question is um, just do a quick breakdown of the difference between the the radio equipment upgrade that we have in the plan coming up for this coming year um, and versus the IMC software, um, which is we have scheduled for a few years down the road. 
Okay, if you don't mind, I'll work backwards. Um, sure. the, ra the radio I thought was for an FY26 project. So. No, so we the radio is in for FY24. Um, okay. Because of the what we were told is in terms of the. the import, of, uh, it was the importance of that, Mike. Yeah. Is why we moved it up. Sure. I mean, it, it is becoming legacy equipment. So uh, our radio vendor will be happy to hear that. Um, so what we, the equipment we have right now was refreshed about seven years ago. It's really going on 13 years old now. This will be the first uh, major radio upgrade we've done. And it's radio equipment in the comm center and in the station officer's position. So it allows for a lot more um, interoperability as we move forward. And it's designed for upgrading or the uh, emerging technologies as we go forward. Um, the what you refer to as the IMC project is actually the computer aided dispatch and record management system. So it so serves a dual purpose. And I'm sure that Captain Ting or Captain Young could speak on. And even as Earl was saying earlier, the equipment we have, the CAD system, the record management system we have right now makes it very difficult to extrapolate any type of data and things like that. Um, and this is legacy equipment for sure. It's not being supported the way it was even two years ago. So getting upgrades and if it was ever to fail to get um, any type of repairs on it is very difficult. Uh, the second lead position. So we developed a lead position, which is uh, it's a full-time trained dispatcher who's taking on more responsibility. Part of it was for transition for when I pulled the plug. Um, and what we're looking for now is uh, more supervision for a greater period. Obviously, we'd like to have 24 hour seven supervision, but that's kind of not feasible. But as we bring on newer dispatchers, there's some things that you just need the, uh, the hours in and the expertise and the seniority and having seen things before to deal with the same way that there are, there's a career ladder for the fire department, a career ladder for the police department. We need that extra supervision. Um, the one lead we have now, I've been trying to get up to speed on some of the administrative things, but due, our, due to our staffing levels, um, our lead dispatcher, Jason, Jason Rushford, is on a rotating schedule. And sometimes I see him, sometimes I don't because we're short staffed. I am spending a large percentage of my time on the radio console working the 911 phones and the radios. So we don't have that time to interact, to talk about grants, to talk about things like the budget, to talk about scheduling and payroll and all the other stuff that comes up. So the hope is if we can get the second lead position and it would be um, a promotion, it wouldn't be hiring a, another position. Um, if we can get that second lead, we can have some after hour supervision. We can move Jason into a position where we may get four hours, eight hours a week where we could actually sit in the office and go over some of the things that need to be gone over. And I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions. Well, I was going to, um, uh, let's say, let me call on yeah. Paul and then I was going to ask one and then start recognizing others. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I just, uh, I know Mike and uh, the chief would say, you're welcome to go up and visit the dispatch center and just watch them work. It's an eye-opening experience, especially on a busy night when they are carrying on conversations, managing, dispatching, people receiving 911 calls that were people are freaking out in life emergencies. And, you know, just call ahead. You're, it's open 24 hours. If you can't sleep at night or sometime, uh, swing up there because it really, it's one of the things in my experience in the town where it's like, wow, I just did not know we were doing this every day, 24 hours a day. So I just really encourage you all to take a chance to do that. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, what I wanted to start with is uh, we had discussions the other night about the CRESS program at the council meeting. And uh, this was a little bit when we were just meeting with Earl a few minutes ago. And uh, one of the things, of course, that is uh, sort of envisioned for the year ahead is the development of starting to identify appropriate calls through uh, 
the uh, dispatch that might involve press solely or in partnership with other program, uh, other public service, public safety department, excuse me, public safety departments. So I, I, I guess that um, I'd be um, interested to know a little bit about what you think is uh, the steps that we've taken already or need to take to facilitate that and whether you have any concerns about um, staffing or other needs that you might have to make to help make this work. So Chief, I'm not sure if you want me to answer this one or you want to, I'll start with it. Go ahead, Mike, and if okay. I can jump in. So the, the list of calls that are all um, stated or are read off earlier, those actually came through some collaboration that came from the dispatch center. So those are the type of calls we thought Crest may be able to start on. Um, there's been some other things in the background that we've been working through. Uh, the technology is more or less there, um, but there's been some other uh, things both at um, the procedural level and documentation, other things like that that we're working through. And I'd really defer to the chief or town manager on, on where we're going from there. Yeah, I would just add that um, Andy, we're, it's a work in progress, um, but one of the big uh, um, things that we have to make sure that we're very um, all, all agreeable on is that the dispatchers are probably going to continue to still handle all of the phone calls coming in to request either a police officer and or, or a Crest membership. We certainly know Crest will have uh, direct contact or direct requests for calls from some individuals, but most people are going to call the police dispatch center uh, and it's going to be really come down to some experienced dispatchers to screen the calls to find out what exactly can be sent Cress's way and what that can be sent to the police officer's way so, because I'm concerned we're all concerned that we don't want to have to send Cress into something that is going to go bad or go wrong and have somebody injured and that's the biggest concern we have so we're going to err on the side of caution, you know, because what we're going to be, what we're already telling the police officers is down the road, there will be times we'll send you on a call and you're going to need to make that determination and they will make it like, look, Crest can handle this. Please dispatch Crest to this call. And then, and then that, that'll happen. And I think we just need to get into involved in it and start doing it. And we hope to have it beginning this summer. Um, to dispatch them and we'll figure out as we go and it's going to be a, it's going to be a live you know uh and it's going to change frequently i think to, to establish exactly what types of calls crests can handle and feel confident about handling so i mean there's, there's no easy answer to that question we know it's going to evolve we know what we're going to be sending crests to calls that maybe they shouldn't have been sent to and we're certainly going to send police officers to calls where they're going to defer to crests so um you know it's going to involve just a lot of teamwork. Well, thank you. Uh, Paul, I know you had your hand up and then took it down, so I'm assuming that you no longer yeah. looking the up. Chief, the chief made my point, yeah. So uh, we'll go back to Pam. Thank you. Uh, I see the dispatch center as sort of the linchpin for all the public services. I think it's a great department, so thank you. Um, I have a really dumb question, I guess, and that is what is holding back the formation of the the uh, the second lead position? Is is this um, union negotiation or or what? Why 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 can you not get the second position? And I understand sometimes it takes time. So um, probably the main reason is up until this point we've had a really a senior staff and. It, there was need for a lead position if I want to take a vacation or um, times when I wasn't here. But as our staff becomes younger and younger, we just lost 44 years of dispatching experience in the last three months or no longer than that, about six months now, um, with two people that retired. It's the first time we've had anybody retire from the communication center in the 24 years that I've been here. So um, we're starting to see that type of uh, looking at dispatch as a career but as we get into a younger staff, we're kind of in this weird spot where we try to give senior people their choice of shifts that they bid. And that's kind of been a past practice thing. 
Um, so we're trying to incentivize it. And then we have all these other things that are being added. Our emergency medical dispatch program is becoming uh, the state's requiring more and more documentation on everything we do there. Our grant programs, we have compliance things now that weren't there before. Um, just QA, QI stuff on a on a 24-hour basis. It's just becoming where we need we need somebody responsible um, on more of our shifts. It's also for the police department, fire departments. You know, I don't mind taking calls at two o'clock in the morning um, for questions that are things that are going on, but it's much nicer if there was somebody here um, that had the responsibility, at least they could be the frontline person if the fire department had a question or something went screwy on the, the police department, they need to find out something right away. Recordings and accessing thir certain things that only the admin people have. And well, Pam, I'm not, I'm the, not, the, the position I'm, wasn't, um, the position doesn't exist yet and it wasn't funded. Right. Um, the, this budget is proposing funding for it and if approved then the town manager would work with Mike and the union to create the position, uh, but that's right. why it hasn't been filled in the past. Yeah, it sounds like uh, it sounds like Mike deserves a few evenings off. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, Pam, anything else with that, Dorothy? Um, I'm sure there's a very obvious answer. Uh, I'm on page 135, looking at the number of calls, and it's comparing FY18 with um, FY22 actual. And, you know, it was there was just the numbers are much higher in 18. It was that because, and I, I'm, I'm going to get the facts wrong, we used to do ambulance, we had had, we covered Hadley with the ambulance at that time. Is that why the call volume was much higher in 18? So I don't have the specific uh book you're looking at in front of me, but I could say most likely we were probably still doing Hadley in FY18. Uh, we also had some COVID numbers that are starting, I guess that doesn't really trickle back to FY18, but, um, and just the student population, some different things that the police started doing, uh, different ways that they became uh, I, I don't want to get into this too much, but they, they kind of changed the way they did things where they had a lot more conversations with people instead of doing things some ways they had done in the past. Right, right. Uh, some some population things. And, you know, the, the students over UMass have become much nicer to us. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, the calls that we used to get from them were much more confrontational. So um, all of those things led into it. Okay. Thank you. It's a very interesting answer. Um, that's it. Uh, I think I mentioned this in a previous uh, meeting, but um, in, in, a, in, a, in a previous life, I had the misfortune of having responsibility for a call center. So, Mike, I do appreciate and I want everyone to appreciate it's really hard to find the right people for a call center. It's really hard. And the fact that you, you know, you've kept kept this thing going for so long is really a testament um, to your skills and to the skills of the people that you hired. Um, I do have one question that is um, in, in the larger call centers and your call center may not be big enough. Um, uh, they use a tiered system where, you know, the, the, the newbies, if you will, will handle the calls. And if they can't quite figure out what to do, they kick it back to the next tier. Uh, they kick it to a more experienced person. Do you, do you do that sort of thing or do you not really have the personnel to do that? So we rely on our training heavily. And after that first four months, and when we release somebody to be a dispatcher, they should have all the skills to do it. But you are correct. There are times where there'll be a junior dispatcher that just has never experienced something like this and a senior dispatcher will step in. We simply don't have the staff to, to handle calls that way. Yeah. Um, it may be we, you know, we operate with a minimum of two dispatchers on and you could have one dispatcher that has 20 years and the other that has a year. And if the 20 year dispatcher is dealing with a cardiac arrest and there's a domestic on the other line, it's that dispatcher that has to take it. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, and I'm not going to get into too many stories here, but one of the people we hired came from a center that had this tiered response or tiered responsibilities. So a lot of the larger centers will start with their newer dispatchers will be call takers. And they will take all the information and they'll enter it into a computer system 
and then I'll get it transferred over to the radio dispatcher who will read all that information and then dispatch the call. This person we hired was used to that type of operation. When they came into a place where they had to take the call, check history, ensure safety, and dispatch the call, they said, you know, for the extra three dollars an hour, it's just not worth. So um, the short answer is we just don't have the personnel to handle them that way. I, I assume that was the case, just based on the size of your call center. Um, but thanks anyway. Thanks. Thank it's you for the comments. Great job. I appreciate it. Hey, is there anything else? That chief, I guess we can go on to the next segment, which I guess is the department. Great. Thanks, Mike. You can Thank you. take off. Thank you. Appreciate it. So yeah, just moving into our, uh, our police budget now. Um, you know, we are budgeted at 46 and we are currently at 46. We have four um, new officers that graduated on March 17th and they're about halfway through their field training uh, program. They're all four of them are doing outstanding. Um, Emily, Rebecca, Andrew, and who am I missing? Hey. Steven. 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 Um, you know, they're doing great. And then we just had two officers, uh, Andrew Coblin, who's a local kid and Amherst kid, and Romano, who's from Chicopee, just started the academy, but they won't be out on their own till probably sometime in October. Um, but we are at 46 people. So that, that's good news. Um, our recent accomplishments and key challenges, you guys all have that. Uh, you know, the big ones are being reawarded um, accreditation this past year and also meeting all the post certification standards for everybody in the building. So um, that that went very smoothly and Captain Young handled all of that documentation and it was a lot of work. So uh, we're up to speed there. Um, again, my budget, I think most of you are very familiar with it. 95, 97% of it is personnel cost. Um, and yep, so that's where we are about 97% now for, for personnel cost. Uh, for call volumes, we're starting to see us creep back into pre COVID numbers. And I know I have some questions here that I'll address about some of those numbers. Um, but yeah, we expected it to really kind of get busy last fall, and it kind of didn't um, become as busy as Gabe and I and the officers had thought it kind of moved slowly to the point where now it's really just starting to step up. Um, the spring is, is really getting back into pre-COVID times with call volumes and that sort of thing. So I think you'll see in 2023's call numbers, it'll probably be more like they were pre-COVID. So that's the trends that we're seeing. Um, you want me to just jump into questions, Sean, that I had addressed to me previously? Yeah, that would be good. Sounds good. So I can answer a couple of facilities questions. I know there were two, um, but there was one specific to a full-time uh, position for a um, maintenance person, which we do have it. The question was about a description of a part-time weekend custodian and why isn't that position listed in the staffing trends. Um, that part-time weekend person is even part-time, part-time. So he doesn't come in every weekend. So he comes in as needed. So it's not something that we would have an individual listed on for an every weekend type position. So I, I believe that's the reason, Sean, that it probably wasn't listed is because it's not a full-time, part-time person. Yeah, the only positions we put in the org chart are um, budgeted permanent positions. If they're under 20 hours um, and they're temporary and they fluctuate from week to week, yeah. we don't, and there's budgets for them, but we don't consider them in sort of our FTE for the, yeah. for the town. Yeah. And he's definitely less than 20 hours for sure. So, um, and then the fuel and electricity usage have decreased significantly, which is positive. And the reasoning for that is, um, so last year we had all one, two, three, four, five boilers replaced the old ones were the original ones in this building from 33 years ago. All of those have been replaced and we just started, just had replaced the AC HV system. Um, and that literally just took place. So those costs for the um, fuel oil were expected to go down because it's all new. It's all new. And then we also expect the uh, electricity usage to continue to go down. 
because that equipment's been replaced as well. Um, I do know that, you know, the roof is, is still on the list of things to get fixed on the building because that's the original roof. And we are definitely looking at the potential of um, solar on the roof. So I know our Southern exposure, well, gets just what you'd expect from Southern exposure. So uh, I've kind of been pushing that for a long time, but I know it's in the works. Um, we had some questions about call service and, and Gabe, I'll let you answer those about increases and decreases. So if you wanna jump in. Sure thing, Chief. Um, I will ask for questions for uh, for specifics uh, in a moment, but um, there's, there have been a lot of changes since uh, if you take a look at the chart in fiscal year 22 compared to fiscal year 18. So certainly COVID played a big role in some of those numbers, but um, we consistently analyze uh, where our stats are to forecast problems and, and to try and figure out solutions. And there's a lot of variables and factors that may change our numbers, uh, causing them to either go up or down. Some of those factors um, are staffing levels. Uh, our department's certainly becoming much younger. So there's training milestones and expectations uh, for the new officers. Um, we're seeing a different type of student uh, with the higher standards at UMass. Uh, certainly this year, we've been waiting for the shoe to drop in terms of large scale parties. And we haven't seen that uh, since uh, pre-COVID. So um, there've been a lot of changes with that. Uh, we also credit our outreach efforts. We have a really strong collaboration with the university and Amherst College uh, to figure out solutions and to really keep their students accountable for, for their actions off campus as well. Um, so, this particular year, there's a calendar change uh, in terms of the graduation. And um, we're trying to see, you know, there's some new norms coming out. We're trying to see how that's going to affect our spring. You know, years ago, before that change, they would have graduated around this time, and um, which alleviated a lot of our headaches. And one of those headaches was the Hobart hoedown back in the day. Um, so we're kind of waiting to see if uh, if that's going to resurrect or not, or if if activity is going to increase. And so far, you know, fingers crossed, it's been pretty good. We've been pretty fortunate. Um, and also, you know, we kind of prioritize our our shift in um, focusing on de-escalation and diversion. So um, all of these different uh, variables are going to kind of change the numbers here and there. So with that being said. Uh, are there any particular questions for any of the specific uh, crimes? I had some just that I would fill in, Gabe, because I know um, Sean had sent me some questions. Um, there was one that was, are there any de increases or decreases related to the change in policies with respect to working with fire department or CRESS? And uh, if so, please explain, and including animal welfare. From a policy change, that would be a uh, no. Um, you know, where we do see once Crest really starts to get established on responding to calls, um, where we really see that being beneficial to us is in calls that involve a lot of length of time and a lot of our medical mental calls are just that. You know, sometimes we have to go to a call that involves an individual in crisis. And even though we have our crisis intervention officers, we still only have three officers on the road at any one time. So we just don't have the ability to be with an individual for an hour or two hours or three hours at a time and get them the services and the uh, necessary um, people involved that maybe a crest can do. So we see that as a really big area that crest is going to be able to help us both in call volume and in the time that an officer has to spend with an individual. So uh, we're looking forward to that relief. Um, there was a question um, to discuss what an officer's time commitment and respond to and then finish the reports for a call and examples of those types of calls. So yeah, so, I, know, I know Mandy, Joe, and I, when we met last week, uh, we had these conversations, but you know, if there's an officer involved in a domestic violence case, it is not unusual for that call to take two to three hours because you're talking about having an uh, officer come back, getting, getting statements from an individual, contacting judges, 
contacting uh, civilian advocates for domestic violence and that stuff. And that officer has to be present for that entire type of a call because they have to speak with the judges and make sure that the 209 aids get issued and those types of things. So a domestic violence call can take upwards of two, three, four hours. And that entire time, the officer is not able to respond to calls. Um, you know, drunk driving arrest, same thing. A drunk driving arrest for the processing of that, getting somebody booked, bailed, and that sort of thing. That's a minimum of about a two-hour call. So uh, again, you see that our OUI arrest numbers are up. Um, you know, that's one trend we did see with the return of the students getting back to more normal. We're also seeing an increase in um, not just drunk driving arrests, but impaired impaired driving related to marijuana use and that sort of thing. And we were told that that would happen from all of our, um, when we did outreach to the um, states where they had already had marijuana legalized, Colorado, Washington told us that we would see increases in that and we did see increases in that as well. Um, I think Earl kind of covered how Crest and PD will be working together. You know, this little amount of time that we have been working together, it's been very fluid. It's been very beneficial, I think, to both of us. And we see that continuing to expand. Um, fuel usage going down just a little bit. We've only got uh, four, I think, of our vehicles, or five that are actually the hybrid patrol vehicles. We are running into an issue with maintenance on the new hybrid vehicles. Two of them have been out of service for upwards of a month. They've found a glitch in those vehicles with the, uh, the amount of equipment that we have. It's, it's making them overheat and some wiring has burned. And so Ford is aware of that and they're gonna try and it's not just our department, it's all police departments. So, you know, we haven't seen the full effect of um, gas savings yet with the hybrid vehicles. We anticipate it will be significant though. And I think those were the questions you sent me, Sean. And so if there are other ones, um, yeah, we're here. Did you get the one, Scott, that I just sent? Um, I don't know if you got to look at the ones I just forwarded. And yeah, let me bring it up on my phone here. Did you oh, speak to the one from Anna? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep, we got those. Okay. Can you tell us the amount of overtime worked and amount paid in the last the past year? So, so I've never, I don't believe I've ever used up my entire overtime budget, my entire line item overtime budget since I've been chief. And I we're gonna go over this year. Um, we've had we have to replace every officer that uses a vacation time, sick time, or personal time because we're at minimum, we were at minimum staffing or below minimum staffing up until uh, this last four officers graduated. Every shift that an officer took off had to be replaced on overtime. So um, I'm gonna go over on my overtime budget this year and there's not much I can do about that. The, the positions, the um, you have to give people time off and they have to be filled. So um, I think it's the first time since I become chief that we're gonna exceed our, our overtime line item budget. Um, what is the timeline and the practice for moving to body cameras? I, um, I don't have a solid answer for that. I expect that, and again, I'm not sure about whether the horse goes first or the cart. I wanted to get it out to the um, town council to get their feeling about their approval of the officers. The police officers want body cameras. Um, and that's why I submitted them to the budget. And in conversations I had with Sean, we thought it would be good to defer that um, until after we had conversation with town council about where exactly we want to move and how quickly we want to move on that. I've got quotes from our supplier on what it would cost. Um, so we have the actual cost and I submitted that as a um, capital request. Um, I think that we just need to work out the details of how that fits into the, um, the surveillance bylaw and, and next steps to take. So we're ready to move on that. I don't have, um, I don't know, Anna's still here, yeah. I don't know the specific timeline on when that will happen, Anna. Scott, can I add a couple things? To, um, yeah. yeah, a couple pieces. And Paul, feel free to jump in that have to happen. Um, 
one, I believe it has to be part of negotiations at some point if it isn't already. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that has to occur. Next, it has to go through the surveillance bylaw process. Um, and then one of the reasons we pulled it out uh, from a request for 24, but we still kept it sort of on our radar um, is because we believe there's grant funding that will be available mm -hmm. for it. Um, and uh, to Scott's point, the order in which those three things happen, um, I think we're still working through, um, especially with the surveillance bylaw, because that's a new, I think this will mm -hmm. be the first major application of it. Second. Um, yeah. And, um, but we are starting to, we, we filled out the grant pre-application or we're starting to uh, get ready to submit for that grant. Right. And I would just say, you know, I think a lot of departments are moving to uh, body cams. If the counselors are saying we do not want it, I mean, we should, I would really, that's one of the things we're hoping if the council's like, they no way we don't want to support this. It'd be good for us to start to hear that conversation. So we know we should have a more focused conversation with the council. Um, but we'll, we will be applying for grants because we think that's the best way to move forward to have the money in hand for the capital and then work. We, we will need to do collective bargaining with the union on this. And that's sort of other departments have already done that. It's all over the map in terms of how they've settled out. And then we do would, would do the surveillance bylaw, um, meet that requirement as well. Any other questions on that specific item? Um, and I know there's a couple more questions here from on um, why the large uptick in OUIs. Um, you address that. People are dr drinking and driving more um, and people are smoking marijuana and driving more. Um, nothing's changed from the practices of the police officers. Again, most of the time in an OUI arrest, it involves somebody doing something like, well, A, they gotten into an accident and it's part of the investigation or they're pulled over for speeding and or some other motor vehicle violation and the officer makes ob observations that are uh, obvious that they've been um, dr drinking and driving. So, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Can I just add to that? You know, I do listen to the scanner. There are a fair number of people who call in saying someone's yeah. swerving all over the road in front of me. Can you send a, tr a, a yeah. cruiser to and, and that happens at least a couple of times a day. Yeah. Someone will be driving down the road. They'll call 911 saying this person's driving unsafely. They're speeding up. They're you know, slowing down, whatever it is. And they ask for an art officer to investigate. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, Paul, because you're right. Um, at least a couple of times a day, we'll, we'll get calls of that nature. A lot of times it comes from a PVTA bus driver too, when it's at night, things of that nature. So, um, you know, that's that's a pretty obvious one as well. And I appreciate you bringing that up. And the last you know, while you're on that subject, uh, you know, this takes me back to my select board days. But when uh, we were getting to ready for legalization of marijuana, there was a lot of concern about the challenge to uh, develop protocols for being able to uh, assess whether um, somebody is uh, impeded in driving because of use of marijuana. And I'm curious whether that has turned out to be a problem. Yeah, so what typically would happen, Andy, is the officer will pull somebody over or get a call and have a conversation with them. And they know that there's something not right, right? Through their training and observation, they know they're impaired. And they'll ask them to take a PBT test, which is a breathalyzer test at the side of the vehicle, and they'll blow a 0.0, .0 so there's no alcohol in their system, but the officer can't leave, let that person drive away because they're impaired. And so the, the officer's only other recourse to then is to make the arrest for impaired operation. And then during the course of conversation, the person usually is like, yeah, I smoked a bunch of marijuana earlier, or Sometimes it goes to court and the officer has to testify to what they observed as far as operation or whatever. And, you know, the judge and or, or jury then has to make a decision on that. It, you're, you'd be surprised the number of people who are up front and forth right after the arrest is made and say, yeah, I did. I shouldn't have been driving that sort of thing. They're usually pretty honest about it. So is there anything else in the list? Yeah, there's one last one, and it's the community outreach call that we have. And are those numbers impacted by CRESS? Uh, again, too early to tell on it. Numbers are being impacted by CRESS, uh, probably a little bit. But most of the community outreach calls that we have are started by officers doing follow-up 
on specific type calls or Bill Laramie and all the work that he's doing in neighborhoods and that sort of thing. Um, we now have officers that are going uh, in the morning to the schools and reaching out with uh, working with some of the kids in the middle and elementary schools and um, doing some work there. A lot of it is just follow up. Um, and our crisis intervention team members will follow up on all of those calls. So if we deal with an individual in crisis, they will go and follow up with that individual afterwards. Uh, maybe they get released from the hospital and they'll go back and check on that individual, see if they're doing all right, if they need resources, that sort of thing. Am I missing anything, Gabe? No, that's absolutely correct. I mean, a lot of it is uh, uh, self-initiated proactivity to try and get things done. Um, and we document that. So uh, that, that's, you're going to see the numbers reflect in that. And I think that's it, Sean, for pre-questions. So if, uh, Sean, if there's nothing else, I'll start calling on people. With... Yeah, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a good time to transition to if there's any other questions. Lynn. Um, yeah, actually, I, I was with Anna and um, she and I discussed the body cam. So I, I'll work with the town manager as to when we want to bring that to the council. So that, because it seems to me that your uh, proposal, if you write one for a grant, will be stronger if you have a count, town council vote that indicates the support from the council. Mm -hmm. um, that may also uh, weigh into your negotiations with um, your um, workforce as well. Uh, I want to go back on the uh, on the various trends, though. Uh, community outreach. Uh, there's this serious and ongoing decline. Does that reflect a change in policy and practice, or what is what's going on there? So I can answer that. A lot of that is activity dependent, and that goes back to if you look at the numbers. Um, to pre-COVID, you know, activity was really high. There was, you know, in terms of partying and quality of life issues was was really an issue. Uh, not that it isn't an issue now, it still is. It's just, uh, it's kind of changed. Um, so we really had to ramp up our efforts at that time for uh, outreach initiatives. And, you know, most recently, the activity has kind of died down in terms of large amounts of quality of life issues. Uh, uh, as an example, uh, I think you're kind of familiar with the Grantwood Drive neighborhood. Uh, we expended a lot of energy and time and, and focus on that particular neighborhood. So that one neighborhood presented a lot of issues. So that uh, developed a lot of um, call numbers for us uh, in terms of documenting proactivity. So you know, this year it's really died down and we really haven't had to visit Grantwood too much. And that's just one example. And that's kind of been townwide in terms of uh, large scale issues. Uh, so it really is activity dependent. So you're going to see that number to be really low. Um, but that's not to say that it's not in our uh, forefront. It still is. It's just really activity dependent. You know, one of the other things too, Lynn, is we're really transitioning over to a younger police agency and some of the younger officers are being trained in how exactly what we want them to be doing as far as community out. They're getting their feet wet as taking the initiative to go to a neighborhood and do follow up and that sort of thing. So they still need, they're like puppies. Sometimes they need to be urged to go do that and try some of those things. Um, and then right below that, uh, the mental medical assistance obviously peaked during COVID, but it still seems to be pretty high. And I think Ron could probably speak to that the most. Um, that's certainly an issue that's been uh, extremely prevalent, uh, not only in our town, but nationwide. Uh, Ron is our expert on that. Yeah, so certainly, certainly during the pandemic, um, we those calls uh, did not, those are one of the, the few calls where the numbers did not change. As a matter of fact, they increased during the COVID years. Right. Um, and it, of course, now having a clinician on board for the last year or so, some of the some of the calls that we have are replicated calls because um, we're going back for aftercare checks. So as we try to get people wired in with various different resources, whether it happened to be a recovery coach or something along those lines, 
um, they're reflected. So those numbers, it's a little bit of fuzzy math to be quite frank. And, and a lot of it, it, it looks like there are numbers, but some of those numbers represent the same community member who are, we're trying to wire in with specific resources. So there might be an initial call that involves the police or CRESS, um, but then the clinician will go back and have additional follow-up calls with them that may not even have a, a, an intricate part of police response. It's more, it's more clinician-based or clinical-based. But yet, as, as Captain Ting had said earlier, when Gay was saying, we do need to track our activity to some level because it's grandfathered position. So it's there's a little bit of bean counting in there. Uh, thank you all for all those answers. Dorothy? Um, Lynn asked um, a, many of the questions I had. So the one that I have left is uh, vandalism which seems to be going in the opposite direction of many of the other calls with the more responsible um, college students. So maybe the vandalism is not being caused by college students? Or um, I, I, pers I, I think there's a lot of variables to that. You know, uh, if you look around town, there's a lot more cameras now, um, certainly all over the place. So that certainly factors in as a deterrent um, it's just a lot easier to catch them nowadays. And okay. unfortunately, I can't answer if, if these college students uh, enjoy vandalizing more or less. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of uh, variables to that. And, you know, the consequences nowadays are, are pretty hefty. Like I said, we have a lot of collaboration with the university. And if their students do get in trouble, we report it. And there are heavy sanctions. And most often, these students are a lot more afraid of the, the sanctions coming down from the dean of students office, frankly, than, than a criminal charge. So I certainly think that that uh, plays into it. So, so a follow up on that. Uh, I know that one form of vandalism is stealing street signs, particularly with provocative names. Um, but the other kind of vandalism is like bashing in the windows and, and really damaging property. Is it more silly, stupid? vandalism or is it um, kind of nasty vandalism? Um, I, I would say it's more silly, stupid um, mm -hmm. okay. versus nasty. What I, I guess I would equate nasty vandalism to an on purpose versus more of a wanton destruction, you know, where, you know, these college kids are going to lose their inhibitions and, and especially when they're inebriated, they're going to do stupid things. And most recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we have had some issues like that where there have been some parties at frat, at the frat houses and the fraternity brothers have tried to turn away unwanted guests and they get upset and they pick up a brick or a rock and throw it through their window. So that's more of a, a nasty reason. Um, but we haven't been seeing uh, an, a huge uptick in that. That's something that's been pretty consistent throughout the years. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh... Pam? Thanks. I had two questions and one, obviously, I don't, I don't know the answer to why the number of deaths. Uh, there's a, luckily zero, zero to one homicide in the last five years. Um, are these all accidents in terms of the deaths or, or automobile accidents or what, what causes them? No, I mean, the, the homicide, obviously, the those are never an accident. We have very few and far between. You know, the deaths, the deaths are just ones that we investigate. So uh, we respond to every death. Um, well, not every death, because some of them don't get reported for obvious reasons if they're at the, you know, it's based on elderly and, and things of those nature. But, you know, if we come upon a, a well-being check and the individual's deceased, we still need to conduct an investigation on that. Um, and we do. So, you know, the deaths kind of, it looks like, yeah, they've kind of been consistent until the 22 year. Um, but I don't know if there's any rhyme or re reason to those, Pam, and the numbers changing like that. Thank you. If I could just jump in, Chief, real quick. This, no. So we account for, I guess, what we consider unattended deaths. Mm -hmm. So if there's a death uh, that's being, if there's a patient that's under a physician's care, that would be considered an attended death, which means there would it wouldn't be necessary for police response or investigation. But throughout town, if a resident passes away for medical reasons or whatnot, 
uh, that's something that we would investigate. So the majority of those of those are just that unattended deaths. Thank you. Um, my second question has to do with uh, back to community outreach. And one of the things that we heard on on Wednesday that there was there was uh, a great deal of concern expressed by some of the members of CSSJC and and HRC that the presence of uniformed officers in the school was not something to their liking. Um, are you, what are you thinking these days about that particular activity? Are you, are you reconsidering it based on some of those comments? Well, we, we take the lead from the schools with that, Pam. So we don't ever go to the schools unless, unless we're requested. That's just the way the Amherst community has been ever since I've been a police officer here. We've never really, we've never had a school resource officer. Um, the times we have been in the schools, uh, we used to do like after school activities when I was probably going back 20 years where we would do bike ride programs after school with some of the students who wanted to do it. We used to do homework um, work with some of the students when we, they wanted to. So there are a lot of after school activities we did there's never been anything where we've really been in the schools. Um, Bill Laramie on times would go in with his comfort dog for very specific requests or invitations. Um, and the most recent one was where we were invited to participate at the student's request. Mm -hmm. And this early morning group of students who um, wanted to interact with our officers. And as you, you know, some of our officers, they, they know these students from coaching activities and you know, Gabe himself coaches lacrosse. Casey Nagel coached the junior varsity basketball team. I used to coach soccer and ref soccer back in the day. So we've had interactions with the schools, but we've never been in the schools. Um, I'm kind of sad. To, mm -hmm. I didn't see the the Wednesday meeting. I'm sad to hear people were concerned that we're, you know, having some small activities in the schools again. Um, I, I'd love to hear their reasoning for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Pam, just to, just to add to that, uh, we haven't heard any complaints from the schools or from the students at all. Uh, so all right. far, it's been really positive. Thank you. So I have, uh, since I don't see any other hands up, I have one thing that I wanted to bring up and that I think we can see if we're ready to draw it to a close. Um, Chief, uh, Wednesday night, um, question arose about um, whether uh, the full engagement of Crest would affect staffing needs in the police department. And I spoke up actually and said that based upon my study of budgets over a number of years and my conversations with you at prior budget meetings, that we are at the current level of officers stretched to the point of uh, just having enough officers to be out on the street to handle uh, necessary emergency responses with appropriate backup and that there is no capacity um, to have a 24 seven department with less officers than are currently budgeted. Uh, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to say I was right, I was wrong, and uh, to get it on the record, uh, just to, uh, to get it confirmed. Well, yeah, Andy, you're absolutely right. Um, and I'll try and keep this brief, but we are at the actual minimum where we can be um, when it comes to patrol officers on the street responding to the calls because the next positions that were going to be cut if we were cut further or defunded further were Bill Laramie's uh, community outreach position and then sending detectives back to the to the streets and that would have had a devastating effect on our ability to investigate crimes whether it be domestic violence or for instance uh, I gave Mandy Joe this uh, Example, we are investigating an assault that occurred in one of the schools and off, Detective Nagel was working on it. He had to interview over 20 people who were witnesses to that. 200 man hours probably. 
and scheduling those interviews. And don't forget that most of them were minor. So you have parents involved in their schedules. So, I mean, it, one investigation, um, just to gobble up that many man hours is a big deal for our detective bureau. And, you know, whether it be sexual assaults or anything, it's a necessary part of our agency working as well as we do. But, you know, when you start making comparisons to our agency, you know, Northampton is budgeted at 60. University of Mass is budgeted at 62 officers. Um, we're, have done, have always, and it's just been the culture of this agency, has always done more with less. And it was always a source of pride, but then it was getting to the point when we were hearing all this talk of defunding, we were like, wow, I don't think, I don't think people really understand um, where that would go. You know, when I, and I met with a few of the 413 defunders, they're talking about a defunding of 46, 46, 46, 46. we would be, um, we would be a part-time police department with cuts of that nature. There would be no midnight shift. There would be no detective bureau if you're talking about cuts that significant. So, um, and the last thing I'm going to say about it is I, because I remember a member of the um, CSSJC bringing up the Ed Davis report going back to 2014 and the eight recommendations that he made and six of them were implemented. The only two implementations that did not occur from his report was in, he recommended an increase in staffing to 51 officers and that was never done and he in, in, and he he mandated that the state allocate money for mutual aid training and that never happened. So I was upset about that, that the two items that the, were positive for the police department were never implemented. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay, thank you. I see two other hands up if I may um, go back to the Dorothy. Okay, so uh, I, I wanna ask, uh, with the kind of like trimmed down department, are you able to do uh, frequent um, practices or planning for like a major emergency response, um, such as a shooter incident at the school? And um, I, I mean, you know, following what goes on around the country, um, the Police departments are saying, realizing now, the faster they get there, the better, and just basically run in. I'm just kind of wanted to have you talk a little bit about what your philosophy is and, and how the police department is dealing with this kind of vague, ever-present threat. Right. So that's a good question, Dorothy. Uh, so yeah, we train on that regularly, and we have another training with our entire department going through the schools coming up this summer because, we, like I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of new officers who have received the training in the academy, but they haven't trained specifically with our officers as well. So if they're working a shift where we are going to need to respond to one of our schools or one of our town buildings or anywhere for that matter, um, that is how our response uh, policy is written is we respond immediately, drop everything, go to that call. If it was an incident that happened when I was working, I would be a responding officer. So, um, and there's no waiting around. It's first officer on the scene goes in and then the other officers arrive, they go in as well. That's how we operate. And that's how we've always trained. Um, that training is continuous and it's ongoing. Um, we train regularly with the Amherst College Police Department on that. We have not trained in a while with the University Police Department, although they are part of our backup system. Uh, if there's an incident off campus, they would come to assist us. If there was an incident on campus, we would go to assist them. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I do think it's important that the officers know the schools very, very well, know all the staircases and all the ins and outs. Absolutely. Uh, Lynn? Yes. Um, I want to just um, make sure I'm correct about something and that is that if we don't have the ability to respond as police because we are we become a part-time department that it is the state police that then come in that's correct the people that don't know our town thank you people don't know our town they're distant from our town and uh, with the uh, a little bit of as much delicacy as I can put into it. State police uh, 
They're not perfect as we found out from how they've handled some drunk driving calls that have now required the, the, the convictions be eliminated. Uh, Dorothy? The only thing I would add on that, Andy, as well is, you know, our state police backup, um, their manpower on their shift is three officers. So they have an officer that patrols 91 North. They have an officer that patrols 91 South. And then they have an area patrol. And that area patrol is responsible from Williamsburg to East Hampton, to South Hadley, to Pelham, to as far North as Deerfield. So that one officer is responsible to cover all of those. So if you needed a state police backup, you're gonna get one officer. Greenfield was at a point where they were not having 24 seven for a period. Uh, Alicia, good question. Yes, thank you. Um, I think when the CSWG was talking about um, moving funding away from the PD, it wasn't necessarily about just taking money away. It was more about the moving of the actual services. Um, and so I know that that makes no sense now because Cress is not taking any police calls. But in the future, if Cress were to be taking a certain percentage of police calls, and I think Chief Livingstone said when he was talking about the relationship between the um, Cress and the PD, that the hope is that there will be a reduction in the calls. And so is there any possibility that in the future, when and if Cress were to be like a full-time functioning department that is you, that is helping to decrease in the volume of calls coming from the police, at that point, where th would there be a possibility that you didn't need as many officers on at one time? Yeah, thanks, Alish. Um, because we're at limited numbers of officers where we are now. So in other words, we only have one officer who is responsible for the South town section of town, one officer who's, whose area patrol is the center. So basically from College Street to Faring Street, everything east and west, and then one officer assigned to the north. Um, that is the regular patrol shift. And then when we do have extra officers on on weekends, let's say 7 p.m. to 3 a.m., that's always done on overtime. Um, and if we can, like we've been able to have some officers when we're fully staffed and we haven't been fully staffed in a long time, we would have a couple officers assigned to that 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. shift as overlap. So we wouldn't always have to fill everything with overtime. Somebody could just come in early, maybe for three hours instead of hiring somebody for eight hours. So that sort of thing. So when we're at maximum staffing, and hopefully we will be by this October when everybody's trained and out of the academy and out of their field training. Then, you know, we would have a little bit of filler, I guess you would call it, so that somebody could take a day off and then we wouldn't have to worry about it being filled, ordering person a person to come fill and working on overtime. I mean, I hope we get to the point where Crash is handling some of our calls, but I don't think that's going to get to the point where we would be able to eliminate a police officer from working. Okay, we that makes sense. Um, thank you. And then, so my follow-up to that is just that, um, so, because I heard you say that like a large percentage of the funding is personnel. Mm -hmm. And so is the funding less, it's less related to or connected to the number of calls or the types of service and more connected to just the way in which the department functions that you were talking about, like an officer positioned here, here, and here, and less related to the actual number of calls and things that you are responding to. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if we ever got to the point where we had, you know, as few a calls as like a, well, even Hadley has three officers on now, so, but they used to only have two. Um, you know, the university has five officers on patrol at, at one time. Um, I, I w it would be great if someday we reach the point where we'd only have to have two officers. I mean, when I first became a police officer here 46 years ago, we only had two officers and a sergeant on, um, but that was very short lived. We've had three officer patrols for probably 30 years. So three officers assigned to patrol districts in town. It's been a long time since it's been that status quo. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. In my understanding from prior conversations with uh, you that there are, uh, and unless you know otherwise, it's not always, it's not good practice to send just one car if you're um, concerned that there could be violence involved. Yeah, as a matter of fact, Andy, we have specific protocols that mandate a two officer response on some calls, domestic violence being one of them um, and, and that sort of thing. So, and you know, Gabe talked earlier about the, um, the mindset of the student that we're getting now at the university, which is not bad. And we aren't seeing the types of calls where there are a thousand people at a party. But this weekend we had several where there are 300 and to us that's manageable with two officers. Everyone else in the world of policing thinks we're nuts, but um, you know, that we would respond with just two police officers to a call like that. But that's just how we are kind of geared. That's what we've always been doing. So the behavior of the student has definitely gotten better at least these past two semesters. Um, we're keeping our fingers crossed that it stays that way. Um, we'll see. Paul? Yeah, so I think Alicia elicited some important information. So it's partially about call volume, but what you're saying, Scott, is that it is about coverage. Like mm -hmm. we try to have three officers and three different one in each sector during the that's what, that's what we think is safe coverage for the town from your staffing point of view. And in order to meet that standard, you need X number of officers to cover vacations and all that stuff. And and then you have the this peak times from seven at night to three in the morning that you like to fill in. So it's it's about staffing a fixed, a static number of staffing of, of slots that you need to fill. And how do you fill that? That that's a and so call volume is one one piece of it. Yeah. And the other thing I want to note is about the advantage that Crest brings. And I, you know, I'm a big advantage fan of Crest because I think they really bring just important um, new tools to us. Um, they are, able, as Scott said, they are able to spend a significant amount of time with people. We have prominent members of our community where they're spending hours a day mm -hmm. to help them through some very, very difficult time. And they they have the ability. And and what Earl often says is that we're upstream. We're we're inter we're intercepting people before they get to that nine one one call. If someone has called nine one one on them, they're 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 talking to people in advance. So that's the I think that's the advantage that press brings to us. So. Um, I just want to make that point as well. Thank you. Okay, Sean, do you have something else? Only that it's a good conversation. I just wanted to try to keep us on. Uh, yeah, no, I realize that. Uh, that's, so, um, if there's nothing else for the uh, police department today, um, I'll just leave it for um, both Cress and police that if any members who are present from the uh, committee or the council. Uh, Think of additional questions that um, those I wish I had asked questions. Um, you can send them along to Sean and he'll get get us to the right person. So uh, if you think of a question afterwards, but I want to thank um, all of you, uh, uh, Scott, for the for your final thank you, uh, Dave. And uh, John, thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Great. everybody, for listening to us. See you guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So, with that, um, Sean, are we? Um, We're up to Haley. Yeah. Yep, Haley's here, and she'll um, give an overview of the senior center. Yeah. Yeah. When do you want me to start? Right now. Um, right now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm fired up. Um, you're going to have to probably refresh my memory on this process. It's only the second time around. But um, for anyone who doesn't know or isn't aware, the Senior Center, we are serving and supporting older adults in the community. We are trying to help them be active, help them age in place, um, provide supportive services for caregivers, um, and just make it a fun place that people would love to spend their golden years. Um, you know, I, uh, as director, I've been here almost a year and a half now. Um, we have a program director, licensed clinical social worker, administrative assistant, um, a dining site coordinator, and a 
outreach and volunteer coordinator um, with a team of probably 50 or so volunteers. Um, and then we do also have some other positions through the um, senior employment program um, based out of Springfield. So we, we're very fortunate to have extra hands um, through both of those programs. And I do better with questions. So if people have anything they wanted me to talk about. Yeah. A couple of things, Haley, um, you might want to describe. So um, one, I think for the first time in a long time, um, we were able to increase the senior center supply budget a little bit. I know yeah. that's that's an annual conversation with the finance committee, how um, much the senior center relies on volunteers and, and donations as well. Um, and then the other one, it's sort of outside the budget, but um, I think there was an article today about the, yeah. um, the, the van, transportation yes. van. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm still thinking volunteer fair from earlier, maybe too much sun. Um, so yeah, big thank you to the town for our extra supplies. It's you know really needed and we will definitely put those funds to good use. Um, through ARPA, we were able to hire um, a part-time driver for the Silver Shuttle. Um, we had a beautiful picture in the paper um, of it being in motion. And we are now offering rides on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from nine to three. Um, folks can call the senior center and um, through the senior employment program, we actually have a woman who books the rides. So we have one dedicated person to help us manage all of that. Um, you know, we developed some protocols that I've used um, with the Franklin Regional Transit Authority for vehicle maintenance. Um, the intake process is pretty quick and painless. And um, all the, the fares are really just suggested donations that, um, you know, go to the friends group to help us support gas and, you know, maintenance costs. So, yeah, there were no um, formal question, questions submitted. So really, um, it's up to the committee if you have any questions. Lynn. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Haley, thanks for what you're doing. I have to say I've had more interactions with seniors lately mm -hmm. uh, and they seem to be out and about a whole lot more. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, for instance, one of them was the person that arranged our um, visit to um, Greenleaves. And oh. so it's just, um, you know, to talk about the school. Mm -hmm. So um, it, the place seems energized. And Thank people you. seem to be, um glad to be back in person so uh, i do have a question you brought up the issue of rides and mm -hmm. we also have amherst neighbors as a group do you collaborate with them uh yeah. and in what ways we collaborate quite a bit um i we were just um the other week doing a program together on some of the differences between the two organizations and how we work together um you know we every other friday we do a tech time that Amherst neighbors put together using UMass students, and then we provide the space at the Bang Center. Um, so we'll collaborate with programs like that. Um, we've done events in the past where we invite Amherst neighbors to come on site for coffee as a way to help them get new members and just meet the public. Um, so we do a lot of collaboration. They certainly help a lot with rides and they probably have more capacity right now than we do. But the key with the silver shuttle is that it has a wheelchair lift. So those individuals who are using walkers and wheelchairs who can't get a, a ride through Amherst Neighbors can call us and we, oop, my light went off. <laughs> um, we pr prioritize trips to and from the senior center, um, medical appointments, and then we do like a weekly grocery shopping trip. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Um, I just, someone just passed me this morning, in fact, um, a graph of the population changes from 1990 to roughly 2020. Mm -hmm. And the, besides the, the 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 bracket, which grew slightly, mm -hmm. um, the biggest increase is from age 50 to 54 to 85 plus, which mm -hmm. grew almost the most. So 70 to 74 was the largest gain. I'm not there yet. I'll be very public about that, but I'll be joining, I'll be joining that graph soon. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for the services that you provide. And um, um, I've been I've been struggling with how to how to get information about all the great programs out to people without sort of innovating them. Mm. Um, you know, with, with, with weekly updates, but there is so much going on. Is there, um, 
is there sort of a centralized point where I can direct people to um, probably your website, I guess, on all the activities mm -hmm. that are available? Yeah, uh, the website, and we love to encourage people to call. Um, you know, that it's a great way for us to kind of identify what needs that person might have, you know, as we're talking, maybe there are other concerns that, you know, come up. Um, you know, it's funny that you talk about that graph. I met a woman today at the volunteer fair who told me at 78, she's too young for the senior center. So those are the kind of things that we're, we're up against. Um, and one of the things that we've been really working diligently on for like the past six months or so is how do we get the Gen Xers who will be 60 in two years? How do we get the baby boomers to really embrace the concept of a, a senior center when they don't like being called seniors. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely, it keeps us on our toes. We are a very creative and quirky bunch here um, and we've got our work cut out for us. Anything else, Pat? Oh, Dorothy. Okay, so um, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, in in my old neighborhood in in um, Sunnyside Queens, they had more than one van, and there were mm -hmm. people booked that, that there was great need, particularly for the one with the wheelchair lift. Um, do you need another van? Um, I mean, do you have more demand than you can handle with your um, one van? Which I know it's you didn't have anything for a while, so it's mm -hmm. great to have something. Yes. Um, I, it's too soon for me to say. The only thing I could tell you for sure is that limiting it to three days a week and for a narrow stretch of hours, that is certainly a challenge. Um, you know, for example, Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays works. We have a lot of programs going on, but then we also on Thursdays once a month do a foot clinic, right? But if my van's not active, if I have someone who is using a walker and needs a foot care appointment, you know, I would have to see if my driver can come in on his day off or try to have someone else fill in to drive the van. So um, I'm really thankful that we have it. You know, please mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, but, you know, I, I can definitely tell, like, even in Bernardston with a population of, you know, um, I think it was like a thousand seniors, you know, our van was used daily. Like, mm -hmm. like it was always on the road. Um, and that was for a much smaller community. Right. You know, because I'm just thinking, like, t t today uh, I went to, uh, aqua arthritis at the mm -hmm. uh, Northampton Y, um, which is an activity that is just perfect for most seniors mm -hmm. uh, with any kind of uh, uh, balance, movement, whatever. And it's it's a, it's a great activity, but if people aren't driving, they can't go to something like that. Right. Then uh, uh. a question, other question I had was, um, with the the situation is the meals you can't you're not able to prepare meals on site is that that your it's too small? difficult um one other thing about the transportation that i wanted to say and forgot um i'm looking really aggressively at grants to try to supplement the the arpa funds that we have now um so it's certainly on my radar to keep working on that um but in terms of food preparation, we did have a visit from the health inspector. Um, we are permitted to like brew coffee and serve prepared foods, um, but they were not comfortable with a, a full cooking license. Um, oh. Now we can, I will, I do intend to work with her a little bit. We have like a steamer tray. So maybe if we were doing that, could it be something where we just, um, you know, we're not cooking something on a stove or in an oven. Maybe if it was a steam table, would that be something that we can continue to do or start up again? Um, but, you know. Well, uh, you know, as I mentioned to you before, I was a director of a senior center many yeah. years ago. And the people who are not coming to the center now would come if they served meals like we served at the Ridgewood Older Adult Center, which yeah. was the main meal of the day. Uh, the variety of people from incomes and education that showed up was basically due to the fact that it was a really great hot meal and you didn't have to cook it right. um, in the middle of the day. And if you ever get the new center, I hope that it's <laughs> going to have a fabulous kitchen where a yeah. real cook would be happy cooking because oh, yeah. that, that draws people in. And I would come, if you had that, you would have <laughs> to okay? Yes. Well, Paul has definitely let me bug him quite a bit about that. So I, I think, and he and I are really on the same page where I've said, this is a priority for me and we're working together on that. So yeah, because who doesn't like a good home cooked meal? Yeah. yeah. And, and the last thing is, um, 
I'm thinking about this a lot because I, I have a very old friend coming to visit and she's a mm -hmm. friend with a hearing aid. So the telephone's not good and she is totally useless with the computer. Mm. You know, I actually sat down and wrote a letter and put a stamp and took it to the post office in order to communicate with her. Um, but you said something that really excited me, that buildings that now senior centers are built differently and that there's something I'm not too sure of the science, but that you that can connect in with hearing aids so that yes. the ambient noise, so that if they're in a communal meal, the people with hearing aids are not being bombarded with noise or have to turn them off and not be able to talk to their neighbor. Um, yes. Is that something that you guys are looking into? Um, yes, and I think at one point in talking with um, Maureen Pollock, who's um, no longer with the planning department, but there had been, um, that was identified as something that to move forward and pursue. Um, hearing aids are also really sophisticated now and they are more readily available than they, they used to be. You can get them over the counter. Um, and for your friend, if they don't know, there are some phones you can get where you can talk into it and it'll translate it on a little screen. So if they can't hear you while you're speaking, they can read it. Um, so that, that might be a good option for her. And just okay. quickly, there was, um, there was funding approved a couple of years ago for assistive listening yes, technology that's at the community center. I don't know the status of, um, again, I think Maureen was in uh, sort of spearheading that one, um, but there was funding approved for it, so we can check in on the status of that. Andy, I just yeah. I want to make note that you've lost the quorum of the forum of the finance committee, but we still have the count council or five, and we've lost the quorum of the council. Well, we will pretend you didn't make a quorum call. Okay, that was counting Aunt Anna. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. lost Alicia was the what we, the quorum uh, right. for finance committee. I I didn't I didn't say anything. Okay. So I just wanted to con conclude with Haley that I hope that you stick with us mm -hmm. through the time until we get the center that we're talking about. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it's, that. It's, you know, by that time I will show up. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Duly noted. Okay, anything else that you're going to ask about Senior Center? Other than no, I, can... I just want to say that I, um, I think that there have been great strides made in the uh, department in trying to come out of COVID and become a live service agency, and I've seen it and heard about it. And so, congratulate you on the good work and moving us into that next stage where. Everybody needs to put COVID behind us and not pretend we're still there. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, I could not be more proud of my staff and the work that they do and the support from the community. Um, you know, it, it's not always an easy job, and there are times when it's really difficult. You know, we've had people fall, um, we've had people pass away that we really come to care about. Um, but I think that this. <laughs> The senior center is really, like you said, it's waking up and it is, you know, we put a lot of heart and soul into each day that we're here. Um, and I think people are really starting to get that and, you know, things are just going to grow. Okay. Is there anything more? Because I don't see anyone from, anyone from recreation here, Sean. Yeah. So Marion, I'm guessing there's two Marion. So I'm guessing oh. one is Ray and one is Marion. Um, oh, Ray okay. Harper, recreation director, and Marion Jordan is the operations manager for the rec department. So is there anything else that somebody wants to uh, ask Haley? Oh, I'm happy with a no. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you for being No here. problem. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Okay. Thank you. Um, so one of the Marians, Ray, and this one, Marion, or are you going to let us know? I'll change, I, sorry. Your, I'll, I'll change your name. Uh, right. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to say, I did just find my invite. This is Marion's invite. I'm, I'm on. Um, hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Um, so I'm glad you're here. And, um, uh, budget and uh, look forward to the opportunity. So the way that we've been starting this off is uh, if you have any introductory um, comments that you want to make, um, of things that 
particularly obviously pertaining to budget, but any, uh, in general, how the department is uh, moving anything. And then Sean may have some questions for you. I don't know. And if not, we'll open it up. So start with you, Ray. Okay, thank you. Um, well, yes, I like Haley, this is my second time through, so please point me in a direction if you need to. Um, uh, I can say that we've got a lot of energy in a lot of different places right now in recreation. In terms of the budget, I did want to just introduce our, uh, our uh, financial situation here by saying that we are, uh, I know that, that you all have seen our, uh, our pushes for capital protections on two of our essential assets, pools and Cherry Hill. Um, those are two that we think that the investment, the capital investments are really important for us uh, in terms of keeping those two uh, 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 really important parts of our responsibility to, to connect to the town and to keep people's recreation, recreational lives moving. Um, uh, the pools are, we had a lot of conversations about direction of the pools. We had a lot of conversations about direction of Cherry Hill. Uh, right now, my, my energy is still very consistent in, and we own these, these assets that make us pretty, uh, uh, they're pretty unique uh, 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 tools for us in, in connecting with the town of Amherst. And so that is why we put a lot of energy into thinking about their long-term health uh, and looking at, at capital needs. Uh, we are right now in a position where, where we are looking to uh, you know, maintain our levels of staffing. We've lost some pretty high profile members of our department in the last few months. And we've been able to stem the tide. We're doing what we can to do that. We have sort of shuffled around the way we do our, our org chart in the department and trying to make sure that we have the ability to, to uh, uh, recreate the work that we've lost, to make sure that we have the best possible structure and order of doing our best work going forward. So the staffing push is something that we've also been, been talking about for pretty much my entire year and a half. And lastly, I think uh, the year was strong for us in, in looking at ways to create more revenue in talking about the pools in particular, uh, our, our United, uh, our Amherst United swim team is a program that we think has, has uh, a lot of potential at being a mainstay in our department. It's a really popular program that a lot of kids have gotten into, some new kids that we're trying to find a way. It's recreational programming at its finest. It's competitive, but it's a rec spirit. And there are kids who are trying to be, uh, trying to get some training and some introduction to competitive swimming. And it's a really, really, if, if you get a chance to look at it, it is a really, really uh, sort of engaging way of, of pulling kids in and extending our mission of getting people swimming. And we also introduced the master swimming program, which we think, uh, you know, in addition to uh, addressing adult needs, adult uh, 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 pool needs and adult swimming interests, it also is another thing that we think is long-term a revenue build for us because it has connected us to Hampshire region, uh, to Hampshire college and, and some of the, the, uh, uh, potential capacities to expand our swimming programs there. We are looking for ways to continue uh, doing our job better, doing our job and expanding the way that we do it. And some of our requests are ways of doing that. But in general, we're looking for ways to do our job better and continue to put people in those places. So uh, with, with that said, I, I guess that's my introduction for, for where we are. I would be happy to... Uh, field any questions from the committee, from Sean or Paul, I'd be happy to take any questions from anybody here. And Marion Jordan, my operations manager is here also. So the way that we usually do this is to then see if Sean has received any questions in advance. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you have, Sean. Yeah, there's a few um, that I'll, uh run through and Ray, just if I, if you already answered this, just tell me to skip to the next one. Um, 
the outreach director position uh, this budget proposes um, has been restored. How long was it gone? And what was the rationale for adding this position back? Well, the outreach, the, the director's position has been gone certainly before I got here. Uh, like it about was, three years or it was so. About three years. Yeah. Um, we wanted the position. I've, I've, I've believed that it's been a pretty important part of our department to have uh, essentially two wings. Our sports program, which we have a lot of weight and a lot of energy behind, has a program director in place. Uh, the outreach director position is a very visible, is a very, it basically is, is the, it's, it's our community engagement wing of the department, which includes in it our, our uh, uh, after school and school support uh, purposes. It is our special events and things like July 4th and Winterfest is pulled underneath that outreach director. It's our relationship with the business communities that supports everything we do in the department. But this, uh, this director's position, the amount of work, the amount of, of, of labor and coordinated, coordinated effort in multiple directions there, we believe that this position is a vital part of our longstanding success. Um, uh, because of the number of people that it it gets into, it also includes summer camps, which we uh, I actually don't have. I didn't talk at all about summer camp here at the intro, and I hadn't prepared to talk about summer camp. But summer camp is another place where we think right now is a pretty consistent uh, revenue producer for us. It and the outreach director also presides over that summer camp. So all of our child care. All of our, all of our uh, uh, community-facing uh, uh, taping events that go on in town, that are outside of the town's interest, that that other groups bring town representatives involved, uh, bring, bring representation from the town in. We usually have our outreach directors there to basically promote our our purposes, to put to provide a face for the town in all of these situations, and then also to conduct our own programs, Winterfest, July 4th, Halloween, um, to basically extend our presence in those places where we don't have registra registrations and kids coming in to us, is to go out from recreation. Uh, and so that outreach position is essentially first interaction. The, the outreach is sometimes the first interaction to bring people into our programming, to bring people into our recreational world. We have, we have relationships with some of the housing communities. We have relationships with the business community. Sometimes it is people who come to Amherst. It's their first connection to Amherst Recreation. And just to clarify, um, the, it's not a new position. It's similar to the, the lead dispatcher. Well, well, it's kind of a new position. This is replacing a uh, an existing position and this position position has a little bit more responsibility and can do more than the other position. So in terms of FTE, the, the department is staying the same, um, but in terms of capacity, it's a it's an increase in their capacity. Thank you. Uh, so the next question sort of related, the administrative assistant position is gone. Are those duties being adequately covered by existing staff? Um, I, I, this was a little bit of a confusing question because I'm not sure exactly what um, position it was, was being referred to. Um, the, the one thing I'll say, and Ray, you obviously expand on it is, um, so there was a, a program assistant type position and that's the position that the uh, went away and the outreach position came back. Um, and, but that position um, uh, has the some of those duties have been picked up by others and the, when the outreach position is created they will pick up a lot of the duties um, that that program assistant position had previously so you said the, there, we lost an administrative assistant position and i'm am i do i understand correctly that we're talking about the position that that turned into the outreach director position that's what you're i'm not 100 percent sure um Based, the, the question didn't specify what position they were. So the, so the reason it, we're asking is because there's a vacant administrative assistant position right now, okay. um, which, which Ray is filling. Um, and so staff are doing double duty to fill that position. Um, and then there's a separate one that again is being converted into this outreach position. Uh, I can answer either of those questions. I, let, me, let me try both of those angles here. 
if that administrative position position that we're talking about is that vacant position that we're looking to hire right hire right now that's a position that's going through slight changes for us but it is a it's a really important position for us to fill because it's the hub of our office it's the it's the one that that basically does our payroll it that manages our front desk and it's it's basically the 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 primary customer service part of our department and so that is a really important position it is right now we have a lot of people filling that role and trying to trying to manage the the missing responsibilities there uh, if we're talking about the position that that is so-called lost when we create the program director position that position we also at the same time part of the responsibilities that the the person who had that position before uh, did it was it was juggling special events and it was juggling the all of those those outreach uh, uh, responsibilities along with managing summer camp we did hire a a seasonal uh summer camp director a coordinator of our summer camps and so so in terms of covering that role that that role essentially is being absorbed into the program director's job what is the one piece that we're taking out of it and leaving it in a summer seasonal position is the summer camps that's the one that's the one part of that old job that is now being situated in another person that we've been able to to uh, uh, create the 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 space and the budget to make sure that we have that seasonal uh, that 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 seasonal performance. We have somebody hired for six months that will be running that camp, and so so the position that's that we lose when we when we bring back the outreach director, it is being the responsibilities are being absorbed by the outreach director and by the summer camp coordinator. The next one, um, Ray, is will this department, this may be for Ray and Paul, um, will this department be responsible for the town manager goal, exploring ways to promote a more child and family friendly town culture? Yes, um, uh, I think <laughs> I can explain. I, uh, I think that's what, draw, uh, what, what drew me to this position. Uh, town manager's goals are my goals. I think that that is why I think this job is for me right now because it's all I'm thinking about is the best job in this town I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, that that is a chance for us to look at child interactions trying to create uh, trying to create a way to allow Amherst youth to have ownership of their own experience here we have a long way there's a lot of ways we've been talking to partner organizations about how to do that better um, but that is I, I think that we are situated to do that. And I just would add, um, you know, Ray's done a phenomenal job since he's been here making connections with people, with different departments, especially. I mean, he's gone through some significant staff change, which he's managing well. Um, it's not easy. Marion and Ray will both attest, I'm sure. But um, just credit to, to his team for keeping the, the rec department moving forward. Um, but especially the, what you just heard is raise is what makes him such a terrific leader for that department. The next question is, um, how does our recreation spending compare to similar sized munis uh, municipalities? Um, this one's always a tough one to answer um, in part because every community does things a little bit differently. Um, so we have a dedicated recreation department um, some communities have a parks and rec department that are combined. Um, some do a lot of in-house programming. Some uh, rely on um, uh, nonprofits in their community. I think Dorothy, you mentioned a good example of one. You know, where you were at the YMCA um, in Northampton. You know, we don't have a uh, we don't have a comparable entity to the YMCA here, so a lot of that falls to the rec department. Um, so I think it really varies. Uh, town to town. I've, I took a quick look at like East Hampton, North Hampton, and it's pretty um, different depending on what community you look at. Red, do you want to add anything based on your experience with uh, your colleagues? I haven't had a chance yet to really do thorough comparison between uh, you know our, our systems and others. I think that that certainly is on my to-do list here. 
as I move into a little bit of, it, of veteran status, but I, I, uh, um, I know from my experiences with other departments, working with other departments in the past, that we are different. We are, um, you know, I, I just recently came back from a, from a rec conference, from a director's conference, where, where it was, uh, I think it became pretty obvious to me that, that we do some things very differently from, from some traditional parks and recs programs. So. Um, okay, so we're, sh I, I think we'll take, um, unless you have an objection, Andy, we'll take rack pools, golf course sort of as a, as a whole um, for the sake of efficiency. I think so. And I was okay. going to point out to um, counselors and uh, finance committee members who uh, didn't think to look. Um, in addition to the community services section in the budget, there's another important section to pay attention to when you're talking about recreation. That's the revolving fund section that begins on page 249, uh, because uh, Sean can explain why and how it's set up, but programs that are supported by um, family contributions, whether it be summer camp programs or recreation programs were uh, fees are being paid. Um, some a lot of those expenses and um, revenues are shown in revolving funds. Yeah, um, Ray and Guilford are in unique positions in that they get to juggle multiple funds to uh, support their operations. So um, Guilford with his enterprise funds and Ray with um, three revolving funds. So. Um, sort of the base level of, of rec activities is funded within the operating budget and most of the positions are funded within the operating budget. Um, but then the a lot of the programming that takes place are, are in three, revol um, three revolving funds. Um, and the reason they're set up like that is because of, there's fees charged for those programs. Um, so the fee revenue for those programs go in as a revenue source and then the revenue is used to pay for the programs themselves, to pay for instructors, officials, whatever needs to happen. Um, and so the three revolving funds that we have are adult education, which is, um, on the, there's not much going on there. There's a couple programs in adult ed. Um, next is our um, uh, after school revolving fund and ready to jump in if I, if I have an awkward pause again. Um, <laughs> our after school revolving fund, which manages uh, our after school program at Crocker. Um, is that two sites or just, just a cracker now? No, just a cracker. Okay. Um, so again, there's tuition paid for after school and then that pays for the instructors um, and, the, and the supplies that go along with it. Um, and then there's our sort of programs, the sports programs, um, anything like that, even the sort of sandlot programs or the pickup type things. Um, those are all within a, a third revolving fund. And so there's a, yeah, there's a section on that. Um, those were hit pretty hard during the pandemic. So I would say this is an area sort of like our transportation and some of our other you know, water and sewer, this is one of the areas that was hit hardest by the pandemic because it limited so much of what they could do and how um, how they did it. And so, you know, you, you lose some people when you don't have the programs that you've had for a couple of years because of the pandemic. And so Ray's been doing what he can to kind of get people back. And that's why I talked about the outreach position being so important um, is because you've got to get people back in and, and get, a, get the numbers sort of to where they were before. Um, and we're seeing progress on that front. Um, so the next question, uh, again, I'm transitioning to the pools. So within the operating budget, we sort of have three sections of rec. We have the sort of rec administration, then we have pools, and then we have Cherry Hill. Um, and so we finished the, the first piece of that. Pools is next. And the question is, do we have adequate maintenance and staffing to avoid a repeat of last summer um, when we had the, because of that mechanical issue, the uh, pool was down for a little bit? Uh do we have adequate maintenance and staffing? Um, uh, I think uh, you know we've talked to DPW about about you know, making sure that we're uh, doing service checks on the pools ahead of time. We do have an inspection coming up before the year again, but that mechanical issue. I don't know if we have fail safes for every potential problem, but we are confident that the that. Uh, in our conversation with DPW that they have, uh, they'll have the pools up and running. I think last year was a very rare uh, uh, mechanical 
problem. It wasn't a matter of where, it wasn't a matter, it was a, uh, that was an issue that we ran into and it was unfortunate because it knocked us out of the beginning of our summer season. Um, uh, in terms of staffing, we are right now in the process of building our, our aquatic staff. Uh, we staffing wasn't as much the concern last year. We if anything because of the mechanics issue. We were overstaffed, and we certainly felt that in our budget. But we, if anything, we were overstaffed last year to manage the pools at least for the first half of the season. Um, but it was an unex it was an unexpected situation. It was an unexpected failure. I don't believe that that we have to worry about anything particular on on that mechanic issue. Will the um, wait-in pool be open at Mill River this year? Yes, and I spoke to Denise today just to make sure that we were talking about uh, uh, you know, scheduling the opening anyways, but I did ask her specifically about the Denise Leckenby, our aquatics uh, coordinator. I did speak to her about the waiting pool and about potentially expanding more access to the waiting pool. And she is, she is on top of that. That's a, that is a popular piece of it. We lost a little bit of that last year also because of staffing. Staffing would be in effect there more than it would be for the, for the mechanical issue. But we are looking to build a staff that can cover that waiting pool Good. more thoroughly. So the last um, couple of questions are for Cherry Hill and I'll probably take um, I'll probably take these two and again, right, jump in if you want. Uh, the first question is uh, the requested appropriation is 223469 and there is a long-term goal of paying full operating expenses out of fees and income. Uh, what percent increase in fees would this represent to the current membership? Um, so difficult to answer that question specifically. What I will say is that um, they, Rec, um, Ray and Marion, they did recently look at fee levels at Cherry Hill. Um, they were adjusted this past, it was just this past uh, fall that they were updated. Yes. Um, and so uh, they have made adjustments to that and we'll continue to monitor our rates compared to other you know, similar municipal nine hole courses. Um, and then the other thing I'll point out is that the, the one of the very few silver linings of the pandemic was that Chair Hill did really well. Um, two years in a row, maybe the only two years in a long, long time, um, revenues exceeded, um, it, Operating revenues exceeded operating expenses. I, I'll say it didn't cover all capital needs, but um, but just the fact that it was covering operating expenses is a big improvement. Um, so FY23, we'll see if we can keep that trend continuing. Um, as of uh, the third quarter, there was a little bit of a deficit, but some of that's timing because the, the revenues for golf kind of comes in two waves throughout the year. Um, and when I looked at that, oh, and the other thing is, Cherry Hill is not in a revolving fund. In some ways, it'd be beneficial if it was. Um, so that if revenues came in higher, they could spend more. Um, but it's not. It was brought into the general fund budget a while ago. So all the revenues for Cherry Hill are sort of revenues for the whole budget. Um, and even if they bring in more money, it doesn't help them. They still have to stick within their operating budget, which can be a difficult challenge for Ray. Um, so again, well, well, that's all good news that they brought in more money. It doesn't help expand flexibility there. Um, through the third quarter, which we'll be presenting this third quarter report to the committee in the next, whenever we have time, um, uh, Cherry Hill was about 76% spent um, through the year. So more or less on track. Again, some of that's um, a little hard to gauge because again, same, similar to revenues on their expenses, they sort of have two waves of expenses as well in terms of staffing. Um, for staffing the, the clubhouse. Um, so we'll report more on that to the committee soon. And I think that was, I'll double check. I think that was it for um, submitted questions. So if there's any other questions people wanna ask, now would be time to- Yeah, I'm gonna start uh, with, since you just were dealing with the golf course question and I'll just jump to there first. Uh, you know, you've raised a good question as to why it was set up as a separate budget as, a, as opposed to a revolving fund within the recreation department. And I think you have to go back and look at the history of the uh, golf course and driven by one citizen in particular who wanted to make sure that it was breaking even because it was put out as it was acquired that it would break even. Um, Sadly, that citizen is 
no longer with us, but um, in any event, that was the thought, and there are some people who still look for that. Um, the uh, budget book itself doesn't help assess that because uh, in you know prior times, it showed revenue. It doesn't show revenue, so you can't look to see if the revenue balances the costs anyway. And uh, I was wondering uh, why revenue isn't listed, uh, which is really a Sean question. So it kind of is, it, maybe it's not, It's I agree with you, it's not listed in a helpful way. Um, it is broken down on, um, on the local receipts section of revenues for departmental, um, it breaks down the departmental revenue um, category. So we do provide it there, um, but your point in terms of having one place where you can look at the operation and how it did, it's not, um, it's not listed altogether. So we can look at that um, in the future if that's a helpful addition, um, or we can just provide the information when you need it. Um, I think we reevaluate the department and whether it should go yeah, revolving as a revolving fund, right? I, um, there's definitely some logic to doing that. It would be like any other program that uh, recreation oversees, um, and within the revolving fund, you could have it very clearly broken out: rec, uh, Cherry Hill revenues and Cherry Hill expenses. Um, I believe it was once, and Mary, maybe you recall. I believe it was once either an enterprise fund or it was a revolving fund, but it because it struggled year after year to break even. That's why it was ultimately brought into the operating budget, um, because if it goes into a revolving fund or an enterprise fund, it's supposed to break even regularly, um, and it wasn't doing that back in that time. So um, it's something we'll continue to evaluate. Uh, the other question I keep being looking to see if hands are going up and nobody is uh, going there yet, so that's why I'm keeping going. Um, I was curious about several things having to go back to the pools question for a moment, and that is Amherst United, is that um, replacing Tritons or is, you know, how does, what's the relationship there if not? Uh, no, it's not replacing. It is, uh, I, I don't have a lot of working, like inside working understanding of Tritons, but the Tritons is separate entirely from our operations. The Tritons also use the same pool we're neighbors and we we use the same the same space uh they are a they're a they're a training club that has training club uh, uh missions goals and one when, when amherst united began for us as a rec department program it began for us as a way of taking people who maybe aren't looking for the Olympic, uh, the, the uh, Olympic track, uh, uh, swimming, swimming, uh, 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 you know, to, to have lessons at that level. Uh, they're looking to just get in a pool and compete at a, as a recreational program. We are allowed to do basically swimming. It's a feeder program for the high schools where people who end up, end up swimming it's a chance for people to work and exercise for people who maybe don't want to jump into a world it's it's club versus rec that just we are operating the rec portion of this sport um tritons may still be doing some things with rec interests what they do or what their interests are, are not my concern but our entire concern is giving uh young swimmers middle school elementary school high school, giving them an opportunity to get in and swim at their own, sort of at their own level, at their own capacity. And that's that's why we think that it has been so popular. Yeah, I was just curious, having had prior involvements in Tritons when I had kids of the appropriate age, I was just curious about that. Mm -hmm. As far as the swimming pool itself is concerned, um, in the use of the outdoor pools, has there been a shift in the mission of what the pools, what the you know major goals are, and vision for the for the um, use of those facilities? Um, 
I don't believe there's been a shift. Uh, uh, that's not something that I've consciously steered in a new direction. Our goal is to make uh, is, is to provide the opportunity for lessons to the entire town, uh, to every child in town that we want to, uh, one of our goals is to make it possible that everybody has a chance to uh, learn how to swim. We want to try and provide enough space for people to uh, have recreational access as young folks, as adults, as you know, we put together that master's program, Denise's piloted a master's program over at Hampshire, which is allowing uh, training adults to have basically, basically it's, 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 a, it, it's, a, it's a program that allows people at, at a high level of skill to get tutelage and get, get coached in swimming and to compete to work on their fitness and their health. So it's a way for us to engage the entire town in terms of the youth, we still, it's still a major part of our camps. War Memorial is still a major part of our, of our camp operations to provide in our summer camps, kids the opportunity to learn how to swim and also recreational play in the pools. It's one of the big attractions why people send kids to camp. Uh, and so the, the pool is a matter of public health. It's a matter of public engagement. Last year, uh, certainly uh, with the encouragement of the town manager, we did extend free days when the summer got really hot on a couple weekends. Uh, we extended free opportunities, free access to the pools for the entire town to come in. There was once towards the end, in the middle of August, and then once at the very end when it got blazing hot, we did offer that. It's a chance for us to reach out. We have a partnership with the Survival Center where we, where we produce swim passes for the survival center to distribute to uh, people who use their services, people who they're familiar with. And that's a good way of us getting out and, and supporting other institutions in the town that share our mission of, of giving recreational access and, and the public health of, of uh, learning to swim, having an opportunity to, to get that type of exercise. It's, and it's a pretty popular feature over the survival center also. So we're, because it's an important asset for us, we want to try and democratize it as much as we can and give as many people a chance to, 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 to use it, to make it, uh, it, it, when I say revenue producing, it also does draw a lot of people. We've had a conversation very recently about, about what our mission is. We, every, every town doesn't have Public pools, public outdoor pools like this, and so we do see in the summertime a lot of people coming to us from from surrounding towns, from sometimes camps from other towns, or uh, you know just drop in pool visits that come in. And so there are a lot of people who use our pools. I think it's I think it's a really privileged position for us to be in. I agree, and I did make that last question and see if then there's others. Is, um, I've heard some comments and complaints from people who are um, recreational swimmers who like to do lap swimming, that they want frequency and regularity of hours. And... Um, that otherwise it isn't a good solution for somebody who likes to do regular uh, lap swimming. And we were getting a lot of people coming from out of town, not, not Amherst residents, but who were augmenting our attendance and uh, our revenue at one point with that particular segment of our programming. And so I was wondering if you've done any analysis to see if uh, the way that pool hours is being arranged is a net positive and not going to be a net negative for pool membership and daily uh, paid participation. Uh, I can tell you that no, I have not done any, any uh any quantitative uh, studies into the distribution of uh, who's using and how much money yet we have uh, we have spent a lot of time and energy in trying to trying to set those schedules um 
Denise Leckenby and Marion certainly have been looking at, at uh, 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 setting schedules that made the most sense to the most to to the to the most people that are using those pools. I think the 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 finality the 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 it's it's a it's a finite resource. And so, in terms of making sure that there's downtime for clean, make sure that we have staffing resources, making sure that we have uh, you know, that, that we can manage it. We're trying to make sure we get as many people to do as much good for as many people as possible. Um, I believe that 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 we've put together a program, a schedule that I think is is uh, you know that does provide as much of that opportunity as we can. Um, uh, and so, when the question comes up about whether or not these pools that go back to the fact that having these two outdoor pools are an asset when the question comes up as we've already started thinking and looking at that question about just how important those pools are uh, we are we know that there's we do overlap pool times we have we have in terms of all the people that we know use it the programs we have the lessons the lap swim uh, 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 early morning early morning swims, uh, uh, you know, free time in the pools. We, as, as much as we schedule in there, we can't schedule enough for everybody. And so having those two pools is a really important part of, of our being able to, our, our be able to keep those people who rely on those pools, at least to some sense happy. Uh, you know, pool, the camps aren't necessarily always happy about the amount of time they get. Uh, the, the people at the, uh, you know, uh, that we've we've extended early hours for masters, and that's that's also not something that makes that that everybody gets uh, everything that they're looking for. It's a finite resource, and I think that certainly, uh, I, I think Denise has done a remarkable job in her first year of trying to hear and look at all of those interests and put together a program that speaks to all of them. No, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me get on to Lynn. Thank you. Um, first of all, I really want to compliment you on the alternative swimming program. I've heard really positive and significant uh, feedback about it and the just providing recreational opportunities for people who don't want to be at, as you said, Olympic level of competition is, is just a real plus for kids. I, you know, I'm one of those people that learned to swim early in life and I'm glad I did. Uh, I want to go back to Cherry Hill because from time to time, there's been a suggestion, particularly as we were in COVID, of trying to kind of grow the uses of the clubhouse and, um, you know, make it more of a community facility uh, and so forth. And I wonder if there's been any further discussion about that. Um, I can say with regret that's been that's been tabled probably about eight times. We've we've had conversations with with uh, uh, golf members. One of my first conversations was to sort of introduce myself up to the Cherry Hill community and to meet some of the folks that were there. And we started brainstorming ideas. What is it that we want here? We've come back to it a number of different times. We talked about I talked with the Mill District about partnering a little bit with 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 uh, providing more access to trying to find a way to make that clubhouse more inviting. There there uh, there are some limitations, obviously, to the physical space and the way it's laid out to how to do that. But we have been looking at that for a while as we've the it hasn't been able to crack through as an immediate priority for us here in this period of time as we've been chasing these other these other goals but it is something that is really important i know it's important for our golfing community i know people want to try and use it we talked a little bit about about the cost of keeping the clubhouse open in the winter time to extend, extend some of its versatility and do some do some like clubhouse sort of things up there for kids or movie nights or game nights or something in the clubhouse just to get people into the into the clubhouse to to make it a space that is not just a walk by uh, find a way to raise revenue but we've been looking at ways to try and do that even outside of the outside of the uh, uh the, the given golf season, um, that is a, a matter of concern that we just haven't been able to, to finish yet. Thank you. I'm Thank you. Hey, uh, 
Dorothy. I uh, just want to say that I started, um, I came to Amherst first uh, as a visiting grandmother who took babies to the swim classes in the big pool. And that was really exciting. Um, in terms of the question about um, lane swimming, um, at the Hampshire Y, um, you have to join, though there are subsidized memberships, but at the pools, I remember joining, uh, and there was an out-of-town fee and an in-town fee. And I know that there's subsidized memberships. And if you have a membership, if you're a member of the pool, um, we have an app, and I can go on that, that app, and it has my favorite activities that are going to be happening. And I can sign up, and they'll say exactly how many spots are going to be in it and the time frame. And then if it's full, you get put on a wait list, and it's all done automatically. And I can back out at the last minute, and I always know somebody will be on that wait list. And that's how lap swimming is done. I mean, it was stricter during COVID, but now people reserve for a certain time slot. Um, and this app, I can handle it. I mean, you know, I am not a technologically, I'm a you know, fancy person, but I can handle this app. And I could show my husband how to do it. So um, I think that's one way to get some lane swimming in because I, I understand there's tremendous demands on the pool. And um, a lot of people like me wanted to go and swim with uh, babies, you know, uh, which is what uh, people who want to swim laps don't want to have happening at the same time or the same part. But I also love the waiting pools. Uh, the way I haven't actually been there when the waiting pools have been uh, jumping. But, uh, but that's, I think that's uh, what you said is, is kind of the nexus of our management issues is when we have overlaps in there, when we have, when we split the pools between activities and sometimes uh, having to compromise in that space is, is the pressure point for us. Again, I think Denise has done a remarkable job at, at uh, setting up schedules and, and communicating those schedules to the people that are, that are going to be using it. Um, I also will say that in, you you talk about uh, trying to find ways to make the process a little bit a little bit smoother. Uh, Marion is here. Marion has been has been uh, you know really trying to find ways to make sure that that when people are signing up to use these is is user friendly. That we have if there's any way to try and to make that process quicker and easier. We are uh, we're not stuck in trying to do things that worked back before. COVID before we came aboard, we are looking at ways with feedback from people. So I would, I would certainly encourage people to, to share those concerns. If there are concerns that would, things that would make things easier uh, in operations, share it with us, share it with our operations manager. We can, we can make that work. And did you, um, yeah. given we have one more department, do, can we make this the last question? Uh, yeah, Jennifer? It's not that important. I can. I didn't realize we had something after this. Oh no, it's okay. Uh, go ahead, Jenna. You can ask. I, it could, it. I, I could probably find this in the budget. But does, in terms of insurance, the recreation department is just under the town's insurance? Because I can't even imagine when you have you know kids and swimming and. Yep. Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, their activities. Any town sponsored activity is under the town's insurance. Towns. Yeah. And, and again, and the summer camp, you don't contract that. We don't contract that out. You run that so that so you staff there's you certain, there's staff certain camps that. that maybe have an outside person but the general summer camp is all run by the rec department okay sports clinic sports clinics are frequently outside groups that come in sometimes they come in because of insurance uh, that certainly makes it easier for some people to uh, come in under our umbrella but we are uh, we do run that summer camp we do run that day camp and I just wanted to um, quickly echo again a, a big thank you to Marion and Ray. Um, they've navigated some bumpy waters. They've had some staffing issues. Um, Ray has been rec director, coach, uh, facility manager. Um, you name the title. Ray has uh, worn it, and Marion, you know, keeps everything moving despite was, all the, the turmoil around her. She's, I was, I was she's gonna, always calm and happy, and, and keeps things moving forward. So. Um, I was going to say, just if I look smart, it's only because Marion's here. Uh, so, so, so thank you, Marion, and thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate Bye -bye. and appreciate all you're doing. And uh, it's a complex department with a lot of pieces, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you.
Um, Thank you. We have one person left in that's uh, for today, and that's uh, Veteran Services. Yeah, so Steve is here. Steve Connors, our veterans agent. Um, it's a relatively small section of our budget, but it's an important function. Um, Steve can uh, speak a little bit to it, um, just be keeping time in mind. Um, but essentially, there's two major functions within the veterans group. There's our cost. There's the assessment um, that we pay to be a part of the veterans uh, sort of county system, uh, us with Northampton and then several other small communities. Um, and then there's the benefits that we pay out. And Steve really man he manages the system, but he also is in charge of managing the benefits that we pay out to um, better veterans for eligible costs. Um, Steve, you want to give a little overview? Yes. Hey, um, sorry. I thought this was an in-person thing, but I've had five budget meetings in the last three weeks, so I lose track of who's who. Um, so my apologies. Um, but yeah, so we have been um, in the creation of a district since FY09, um, and Amherst has been an original member. We started at six and we are now at 11 communities. Um, well, actually, I should say we're up to 12, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, we pride ourselves in delivering the benefits that um, eligible veterans and their dependents um, receive because we uh, pretty much, as a general rule, always get our 75% back. Uh, it's going to be very rare that you'll see any of our communities not get the full 75% back. And if we don't get it, it's usually because I've gone to the mayor, the town manager, the town administrator of the community and said, look, we're going to need, you know, if, if it's all right with you folks, we need to try to assist this person. I know it's not going to get authorized by the um, State Department of Veteran Services, now the Executive Office of Veteran Services, um, but can we help this family anyways or this veteran? So other than that, pretty much Amherst has always gotten the 75% back um, while we've been managing the Chapter 115 benefits. The numbers in that have gone down from COVID. Um, they also were dropping down because a lot of the World War II vets and Korean War veterans uh, were passing. Um, a lot of them did not have a lot of um, what do I want to say, pension kind of benefits um, that went to the surviving spouse. So when I first started 19 years ago, we had a lot of uh, World War II veteran widows uh, on our benefits because they just didn't have enough to get by. That hasn't been as much of an issue uh, as it was back then. Um, so our numbers are down there. However, where the numbers are down on our state benefits, they're up throughout the district. And from what we're understanding throughout Western Mass regarding uh, the federal benefits, especially those provided by the VA. And those are both for disability claims for veterans who were injured while serving, both men and women. Um, but there are also claims for you know, their pension their um, their programs that are based on the pension. I know that's confusing. Let me say the the pension with the VA is for any wartime veteran. If they serve during wartime, they get the pension, but they only get the pension if they need it. It's a, not a very large amount. Most people have enough even from Social Security that surpass that. What they may need is um, care in the home because they're homebound or they're in need of aid and attendance of other people to do their activities of daily living. And that is based on the pension. You don't have to have been service connected. You don't have to have a service connected injury. You just have to serve during wartime. We get a lot of calls for that. Uh, if anybody's ever interested in what it takes to do that, um, I will fill you in, but it is a very um, painstaking, document-driven um, process to get people money 
to have to keep a veteran at home or in a uh, assisted living facility. We get a lot of that um, because people will come to us and say, dad or mom, but mostly dad uh, is now so old, he can't live by himself anymore. He can't do this, you know, and we don't know what to do. So that's one of the programs we have. The VA health department is trying to deal with that on a national level because it's becoming an issue. Uh, and there are programs coming on board. That's the, our biggest demand usually in our offices is that kind of need. Uh, with that in mind, I worked with a few other VSOs here in Western Massachusetts um, about how do we deal with it. And we've developed a program. It's called Learn It Before You Need It. And it's about all the steps before your parents are desperate and need this care. We are going to show you all the things that are out there and how to apply for them. And um, I was struggling trying to get it done this spring because there's just not enough hours in the day. Uh, I went to the board, um, which Sean is a member of, and asked one of my positions to be increased um, a few hours back to what it was a year ago um, to help that happen. The, the board did approve it. So uh, there is an increase in this year's budget. But what that means is that come uh, the fall time, we're gonna be spending the summer putting all the materials together, lining up dates and the guests that need to be there because we need to invite about seven, eight people to it but we are going to, uh, in four different locations so far, um, uh, the new, new town that has just joined us, Huntington has a space, which will cover our Chester, Middlefield, Worthington area, along with Huntington. Williamsburg, which is gonna handle the Cummington, Goshen, Chesterfield area. We're gonna do it in Northampton, and we're planning to do it here in Amherst, where we're gonna do this training for families whether I talk with the Jones Library or we do it at the Bangs Community Center, but it's going to address all the needs that families need to know about their ailing uh, parents and especially their veteran father or mother, um, what, what there's out there for them. So- Steve, um, I might, um, given the time, I might just turn it over and, st uh, do you wanna hit any other points before we open up for questions? I just wanna make sure we have time um, um, for questions. Yeah, no, we... that that's the biggest thing. That's okay. the biggest change we're looking for in the year. Otherwise we're, running as normal and and uh and just echoing echoing quickly what you said steve part of that increased hours um there may be increased hours in amherst um specifically in terms of um the, the office that's set up at the banks community center yes exactly and, and the other thing was is we just i went to the select board meeting on wednesday night and the town of huntington voted to join the district so it's so whatever is on the sheet it's going to go down a little bit that helps spread the cost out among a, yeah. a bigger yeah. membership group. And we're getting addressed by another community, but I don't think they're going to join, but they may. But I do know that Huntington has now joined the district as well. Thank you, Steve. Lynn? I basically just want to thank Steve for his service. I think it's terrific that we have this relationship. It's nice to know that Amherst was one of the founding members. Um, so thanks. It's been a pleasure to serve at Amherst. It really has. I have to say that uh, talking about the founding of it and, uh, makes me feel like a relic because it was actually, I guess, uh, John Musanti, Stephanie O'Keefe, and I were at the original meeting with uh, called by Claire Higgins, who was then mayor, that launched this. So. I feel like I've been with it for as long as you've been around, Steve, even though yeah. you were in Northampton before. Um, I have one quick question, and then let's see if there are any others and we can close it up. Uh, the veterans that I now think about uh, is are the youngest veterans uh, who were in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I was wondering if um, we are seeing that population moving in, whether that population is in any way also in our homeless population 
and whether you're able to work with Craig Storrs or Crest to reach them if they are there. Uh, that's a very good question. And yeah, and and people kind of forget they all of us think about veterans that they're older veterans, so on and so forth. But there are a lot of younger veterans who do fall into trouble. So I am on a um, two different um, meetings on Zoom uh, with Craig's place um, and their their people. And anytime there is somebody who is let them know that they are a veteran we talk. So I have addressed in the past. And of course, Earl and I have worked close before in our homeless work. Now he's doing the crest. So he's got my cell phone. I got his. And uh, he actually has helped me out with uh, a veteran right here in Amherst that's had a very difficult year. And um, I've been trying, and so is Earl and the team, tried to assist him to the best of our availability. Uh, unfortunately, now I'm dealing with uh, court and he is going to be evicted. So I'm trying to stay the eviction so I can find him a place to live that's more appropriate before it's uh, enforced. Because if they actually enforce the eviction, then it's going to be really hard to house him. And he's a much older gentleman. Um, but yeah, so both young and old we deal with and um, Cress also does. So we are in communication and I do deal with um the people that earl gets and i send him some of mine as well yeah, thank you are there other questions i don't see anyone sean is there anything else that we need to um there were no questions submitted but again if anybody has any other questions for steve you can send them off send them along to me and um steve's very responsive so i can get answers um to anything you need. Indeed. And look for that program coming in September or October, depending on our schedule. But I think it'll be an impressive program, very helpful to the families, I'm sure. Okay. Right. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And we'll see you maybe at Memorial Day. Oh, yeah, I'll be there. It's going to be a different program. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to be um, giving out the Medal of Liberty, which is a state medal to a family member of a World War II veteran. So it should be quite interesting. So and we are signed up for the parade and the memorial. And Wonderful. we're passing the resolution. Great. I will make sure the reading of the resolutions in the program then. So we will see then. All thank right. You. Thank you. So um, with that said, uh, do we have anything else that we need to do today that you know of, Sean? Did we already do public comment, um, Andy? Yeah, I guess I shouldn't ask. I think it was we have one attendee, ask. just in case. Um, yeah, um, if there is anybody who's uh, in the public who would like to be uh, recognized to speak. Um, Looks like um, the person lost. We have no uh, attention. Yeah. So uh, we've therefore, um, nobody's asking to do public comment. Um, and I can't think of anything that was unanticipated business at this point. Um, I think that when we have more committee members present, we do need to start picking up on the report um, and decision-making stage. I sent out some material to committee members today to um, help that conversation along and when we get to it. And uh, otherwise, um, the other two um, parts of uh, public safety and public service have been put off, I think, till the 23rd, and it's uh, fire and public health. Yes, yep. And so, um, I know I still got to get the questions posted in the packet, um, and I'll send them to everybody. Just have to organize them and um, get the responses plugged in. So I'll send it off to everybody when that's ready. So, so anybody's thought of other? Um, public business and I think uh uh Lynn can we assume that the council is adjourned and the finance committee is adjourned the council is adjourned and finance committee <laughs> have a good weekend bye, bye. bye.